It says you're alive, mister. So now you're alive, mister. So what's going on, buddy? Hold on. Let me just do this. Uh, we don't want to hear my voice. All right, buddy. They can hear you, sir. So what's up? Say something to your audience, mister. Welcome. All Thank right. you for having me back, my friend. Um, always a good time being here. We've uh, It's been a minute, but this was a, a perfect opportunity to circle back around and get together again to uh, just address some just not good exegetical work. So well, look, look. that's what we're going to do tonight and respond to a fellow who has a, a pretty big, uh, pretty big YouTube channel, but uh, he yeah. doesn't really say anything new. And if you've done SDA apologetics as long as I have, it's a standard sort of by the book sort of talking point assertions. And so we will uh, we'll barbecue this uh, in Jesus name. Now, before we begin, maybe you can lead us in prayer and tell them about Again, to remind them, you've been on my channel before. And after we pray, yep. you can remind them about your channel. I have a link to it. Why you do what you do? Because the videos we've done, I've gotten more comments on our sessions and on the Sabbath, the clips, than I've gotten on any other video. Let me repeat, because people don't know this. I have had to delete and call out and insult more people on the videos he did with me and on the clips on the Sabbath than for any other video. Sabbatarians, Seventh-day Adventists, if I were to show you the things they say and how they manifest, you'll be shocked. So if you can begin in prayer, that's the spirit to fill you and I, to speak clearly without error, recall the scriptures and exegete them perfectly correctly and walk in them. And then you can tell us about your background and we can begin. Perfect. Let's do it. I'll start with that. And then we can say uh, the Our Father and uh, Apostles Creed and then do exactly that. So, O oh, Triune God, thank you for today. Thank you for your many blessings, for leading us, guiding us, providing for us, knowing, God, that all good things come from you. That includes the truth. And so we are praying that that is lifted up and exalted tonight, that you would use us as broken vessels, um, as instruments in your hand, Lord, to glorify yourself, to silence lies and deceptions. Um, just asking that you would give us a perfect clarity of thought, perfect memory, that we would uh, just glorify you and season our words with salt. We are praying this as the Son of God taught us, our yes. Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day, Lord, our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, Lord, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. We believe in God the Father, the creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, he suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead, and he ascended into heaven, and now sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from whence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the one holy church, both visible and invisible, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. 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 Glory to the Father, the Spirit. In Jesus' name, Holy Spirit, you are the teacher. May we be your mouthpiece to save us from error and glorify Jesus Christ, your eternal love and companion. In the name of Jesus Christ, glory to the Father, the Spirit. Sorry, I just had to go off camera. All right, brother. Now you want me to bring up the video and the slide? Yeah, well, I can tell people a little bit oh, about me really quick. Tell and then about we can, your uh, background, your ministry. Yeah, totally. Why you, because people said, oh, you're just, you know, you're, you got offended. You got hurt maybe because you're daddy and you got daddy yeah. issues. Yeah. Daddy issues as a as a grown adult now acting out as a as an adult. <laughs> um, I started answering Adventism mainly as a, an educational platform um, to bridge the divide between uh, Orthodox Christian teaching um, as well as Seventh Day Adventist teaching to bridge the divide between those two because this movement has done a good job of PR. They've done a good job of making people think that oh they're or just like you brother. Um, they'll use all the same language, these types of things, very similar to Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, etc. And so uh, my background regarding this, though, is I didn't just kind of cherry pick this, if you will. Uh, I was raised Seventh-day Adventist. I was a third generation 
My dad is an SDA pastor, and I was educated in their schools up through the university level, uh, Sands High School. Um, and so after uh, coming out of Seventh-day Adventism as an adult, uh, I realized and noticed there was a big gap out there regarding Seventh-day Adventism, and rightfully so, because in order to do what it is that we are doing, you're going to have to be somebody that had a great controversy worldview. That is what puts Seventh-day Adventism outside the bounds of orthodoxy. They have a different and unique worldview. Now, we're not going to be getting into necessarily all of that tonight. I have more of that on our platform, on our website, answeringadventism.com. So if you're fancy uh, and want to look into that sort of stuff and understand kind of the starting point of really understanding this cult, you can go to our website and just type in Great Controversy in the little search bar at the top, and all the content that pertains to the Great Controversy will pop up, and you can search to your heart's desire and get familiar with it. But that's really the foundation of what you have to understand to uh, really be able to deal with this, this group. And so over the years, I developed a, a burden for this and didn't feel equipped at the time after coming out. Um, and so I just continued to study and study and study. And over time, uh, this burden continued to just kind of fester and grow. And eventually I got to a point where I realized maybe I'm supposed to do this um, because there needs to be, again, somebody that's doing this, that's able to bridge the gap for people and help them understand, like, no, here's what they mean by this. <laughs> that This is what they're, they're saying here. Um, so that was essentially the, the building blocks of, I didn't know it was necessarily going to be a YouTube channel, et cetera, but here in a couple of weeks, we should have our nonprofit status. And so we will be officially a nonprofit, uh, sometime probably in February. Um, like I said, we have a YouTube channel that is, uh, very, very, very active. And we have a website as well, answeringadventism.com, which, uh, has hundreds of hundreds of articles um, and new things being added constantly. We uh, also have a wall of memes. So if you want to, you can go there and browse uh, even the, the wall of memes and uh, use those to uh, to your heart's content. So that's a little bit about me and, and kind of why I started this. And so with that said, Sam, let's, uh, what up, Sal? Um, let's get into uh, the meat and potatoes of it. All right. So what do you want me to put up on the screen? Let's start by bringing up this individual's video. For my response start with the first time to Sam Shamoon. When a seven-day Adventist tells you, why What's up? a pervert in a box? That's what I call yes. it. Sorry. So he, he, no, you're good. So we'll start with the first timestamp here, and then I'll, I'll pause when we, uh, I've got them all mapped out for us. All right, so right. let's hear what he says. Why don't you keep the Sabbath dates part of the Ten Commandments? They'll say you keep nine out of the Ten Commandments. Why don't you keep all of them? We do keep all of them. Let me answer the question. Yes, we keep all Ten Commandments. Yes, we do keep the Sabbath. No, you don't. Unless you observe the Sabbath the way that is commanded in the Ten Commandments, you don't keep the Sabbath. The Fourth Commandment tells us in Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 through 10, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work. So unless you observe the Sabbath on the seventh day of the week, which corresponds to our Saturday, you are not keeping the Sabbath, no matter how much theological acrobatics you use to try to dance around it. Which I'm pretty sure is what we are going to see here in a minute. A bunch of theological acrobatics trying to make the Bible say something that it doesn't. Okay, so this guy doesn't even realize. Exodus lays out a pattern. I have to tell Adventists this constantly. Exodus lays out, a, well, in Genesis, lays out a pattern. It does not say Saturday. They read that into the text. The weekly Sabbath was observed as a memorial every seven days. They read into the text that that means something about a 24-hour rotation around the sun is divine, such that like at midnight, something now magically changes. That's their understanding, because as we're going to see uh, a little bit later, they extend the Sabbath out, Sam. It's not just something that was uh, a part of or instituted at creation, or some people are going to say instituted specifically with Israel. They're going to say neither of those things. They believe that the Sabbath was around long before the creation of the earth, because again, this gets back into the great controversy. They have this whole pre-earth origin story where they think the Ten Commandments are kind of the central focus of this pre-earth origin story, which started with Satan rebelling against Jesus being exalted to be made equal with the Father. So if you remember when I was on the last time, we talked about these quotes, that in this pre-earth narrative, 
Satan basically became, or Lucifer became jealous that Jesus was exalted to be made equal with the Father. And because of this, he went down the pathway of perdition to eventually starting war in heaven and then getting booted. But this war, what was included in it was the accusation that God's law is not fair. That, and by God's law, they mean the Ten Commandments. So they think the Ten Commandments are eternal in the sense that they've almost existed like an ex, like a, a, a extant thing outside of God, eternally existing alongside him. So that is really what they're, they're getting at there. It's not even necessarily just part of creation. But no, the seventh day was a pattern to be observed, and it was pointing to and teaching mm -hmm. man something, which we will look at later. Any thoughts that you have on that? Yeah, well, besides the fact I can't stand my voice, but may the Lord Jesus Christ be glorified and make our voices pleasing to your ears. <clears throat> Notice again, conveniently, he didn't quote the entirety of the passage, mm -mm. which misses the point I was making. Now, before I do that, Orthodox, you said I've changed. In what way have I changed, buddy? You better comment. <clears throat> Coming back to the issue. Notice that, again, I haven't watched his response because I don't respect him. I don't respect his exegesis. And I'm calling you out because I know you're watching this. Now, be a man. I'll even come on your channel so you can moderate so you don't hide. And I'll demolish you in your arguments, arguments exegetically. So be a man. Don't hide. I'll come to your channel. Call my bluff. I'll come on your channel <clears throat> so you can moderate <clears throat> so I can see how well you do when you're cross-examined. It's okay to be a tough guy behind your screen. But coming back to the issue, he didn't even quote the entirety of the passage. Now, you come from a different angle because you want to go in-depth and use their own sources against them. This is why you're a blessing in that area. You know their sources. You can then <clears throat> expose their assumptions, the presuppositions they're bringing to the passage, and show why their presuppositions are faulty. They're not faithful to Scripture. My response deals with the text itself, not that you're not dealing with the text. You are bringing the text. Right. You're also going behind the background and giving the assumptions they're bringing to the text. Because... If we had looked at the text, you'll see that Israel's Sabbath is being modeled after God's Sabbath. And that yeah. was my point. If you don't attack straw men, and if you're a man of integrity and you're not, this is why I call you Bible pervert in a box, you would actually try to understand what I'm saying. We do keep the very Sabbath mentioned in Exodus 20 because the Sabbath given to Israel is modeled after God's Sabbath. So, yes, I do keep the Sabbath as defined explained, interpreted in the New Testament. But you Bible perverts do not know how to exegete the Old Testament because you subjugate the New Testament to the Old Testament, whereas the New Testament says, no, the Old Testament is to be understood, filtered, mm -hmm. interpreted in light of the New Testament, not the other way around. This is how we know you're Bible perverts. You don't know the scriptures. When I say pervert, meaning perverting the text, not saying morally in your own life, you know, what do you do? behind closed doors. I'm talking about you pervert the text. The New Testament's clear. The Old Testament is subject to the New Testament. Therefore, as a Christian who follows the Lordship of Jesus, I then interpret the Old Testament through the lenses given to me by Christ in the scriptures, inspired by the Spirit for the New Testament church. But we'll get more into that. My guys don't mind my voice, by the way. I don't like Yeah, because he he mentions, you mention it in this video that he's responding to, God's Sabbath and those sorts of things. So people will see what he says. Just to eliminate the uh, potential uh, hangup that he may have, Answering Adventism will also host said discussion if he doesn't want to host on his own channel and you don't want to host sure. here and I will be neutral. Uh -huh. And the discussion can happen that way as well if that is something that would be uh, of interest. Um, so yeah, let's keep going on this. But here's what you do not say, because this is the mistake of Christians. The Sabbath was changed to Sunday. They'll say, no, it wasn't. So Catholics, Coptic, Assyrian Church of the East, Orthodox, please do not use this argument. All denominations now listen to Sam, because apparently God has given him the answers. Do not say, well, the Sabbath is now Sunday. It was changed to Sunday. Do you know why? Do you know why you don't use that argument? Can I tell you why? Because they'll tell you, show me in the New Testament, one verse in the New Testament that says, Sabbath has been changed to Sunday. We now worship on Sunday. You won't find it. It's not in the New Testament. 
Thank you for that admission. That's one of the reasons I became a Sabbath keeper, because there is no evidence of Sunday sacredness in Scripture. Does okay. He, brother, does he also keep the Sabbath year? Yeah, no, which we're going to get into some of that as well, because they make a uh, an artificial distinction between uh, these these two things, which we'll get at a, a little bit. But no, he, he doesn't. Uh, now, my apologetic, Sam, is a bit different here. No, go ahead. Yeah, feel free. Because, uh, uh, and we'll look at this more uh, again. I know I'll, I'll say this a bit here. In a little bit, we'll look at it more, and I promise we will. I am a first-day Sabbatarian, but that doesn't mean I'm a seventh-day Sabbatarian, just on a different day. When I say that, I'm using the term Sabbath the way uh, John Chrysostom did, for example. So, such as in his homilies 39 on Mark 2.28 and Matthew 12.8, which this guy Flockbox is going to butcher later. Notice what Chrysostom says. Can we uh, share my slide now? Yes, yes. Yeah. Right here. Notice what he says. Quote, now, this, again, this is his homilies on Matthew 12, 8 and the parallel Mark 2, 28. The Sabbath was made for man. That's the verse. They would have stretched uh, the law out of shape if when he was giving the law of the Sabbath, Jesus had said, you can work on the Sabbath, but just do good works, do nothing evil. This would have brought out the worst in them. So he restrained them from doing any works at all on the Sabbath. And even this stricter prohibition did not keep them in line. But he himself, in the very act of giving the law of the Sabbath, gave them a veiled sign of things to come. That's the key. For by saying, you must do no work except what shall be done for your life, Exodus 12, 16, he indicated that the intent of the law was to have them refrain from evil works only, not all works. Even in the temple, much, uh, much went on during the Sabbath, and with great diligence and double toil, thus even by this very shadowy saying, Jesus was secretly opening the truth to them. Did Christ then attempt to repeal a law so beneficial as the Sabbath law? Far from it. Rather, he greatly magnified the Sabbath, for with Christ came the time for everyone to be trained by a higher requirement. Close quote. The issue is how Sabbath is defined, what yep. it truly means to keep the Sabbath and other issues. I refuse to concede anything to this movement. Nothing. I concede no scripture. Lots of people leave Adventism and they're willing to just concede certain things to them. I refuse to concede anything to them. That includes the Sabbath, because, again, it's all about how you define that. Like I said, we will get into that later when we get when we address Hebrews uh, three and four. Now, I have a little bit more to say, but it sounds like you have something. So I don't want to just ramble here. Well, I, that's the whole thing. This is why I have no respect for them, because they straw man me and attack an argument I did not make. So when they say, for example, that some have, I haven't heard what this guy said, that I say we don't keep the Sabbath. My argument has been the opposite point. We keep the Sabbath. Yes. They've also straw man me when in response to someone, when I said God himself doesn't keep the Is Israel Sabbath, <clears throat> someone then in a comment section was attacking me saying that I'd stored John 15, 5, 16, 18. Because it says Jesus was saying, my father's working to this day and I too am working, mm -hmm. not understanding the point because they don't want to understand. They want to straw man because it's easier to refute an argument you did not make than the one you made. Say, no, no, see, uh, you're confused because the Sabbath doesn't rule out any and all works. And I never said the Sabbath rules out any and all works. What I was saying in that context was that Jesus is explaining to the Jews that though the father has entered the Sabbath, that doesn't mean he's not working at all. Correct. But still, he's working on the yeah. Sabbath that you are resting from. So he can do things you cannot do. And because I'm one with him, I can do the very same things. Which is why we're going to. They keep Which is why we're going to look at the, that that phrase Israel Sabbath is a colloquialism, but these they don't understand that because he's going to try and say later the Bible never says anywhere Israel's Sabbath, and yeah. he doesn't yeah. understand. It's just a colloquialism to show the distinction, like you just did yeah. that Jesus did in John five, that even though God is in God's rest, He's still working. So the rest of creation and the ceasing was from the creative act. It wasn't from anything, period. But when they use this show me one verse argument, it backfires on them badly. So folks, understand this. This is an area they love to use this. This is what's called the verbatim fallacy. 
that something must be verbatim stated for it to be present in the text, which if this were then turned in on their own system, so you mentioned earlier, Sam, about using their own sources, the other thing I love to do is always be doing an internal critique for the system. So when they make an argument, show me one verse. If we turn that back in on their system, you have to abandon 90% of it because no single verse says verbatim investigative judgment or that Sunday will be the mark of the beast or that the Pope is the Antichrist and literally countless other things that they believe. So it's an inconsistent argument for them because two, they try utilizing reason, deduction, inference, etc., to try and support their doctrines that are not verbatim stated. Only use this argument on this topic usually as well. It's only the Sabbath that they do this whole verbatim thing. But also, Greg, you don't keep the Sabbath. (laughs) Greg does not keep the Sabbath. No SDA who affirms official SDA teaching keeps the Sabbath because to truly keep the Sabbath, one has to know the true Christ and enter into him, which is entering into God's rest. Otherwise, a day means nothing. (laughs) It doesn't matter that you go to church on Saturday when you guys have a false Christ. And if you have a false Christ, You can't be keeping the Sabbath. You can't be keeping the first four commandments because they're God facing. The Sabbath day was a memorial, not the substance of the Sabbath. It pointed to the substance, which is Christ. So since the SDA church has a false Christ and a false gospel, they can't possibly be keeping the fourth commandment or the first four of the commandments. Now, if you can, brother, speak a little slower. We got you. Don't feel rushed. Okay. get it. Another thing you said, I want you to confirm. You said that before God entered his Sabbath rest, what do they believe about Satan and what took place? Could you repeat that point again? Yeah. So prior to when, when you read in Genesis 1, 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. They, they don't believe that that means the angels he- heaven. That is the firmament. They believe that there's this huge unknown period of time yes. between uh, well, like the creation of the universe, the angels, etc., and the creation of the earth. During that period of time, you have this huge pre-earth origin story that mimics a lot of Mormonism. She clearly was influenced not just by John Milton's Paradise Lost, but the Book of Mormon, because the Adventist plan of salvation, chapter four of Ellen White's uh, Spirit of Prophecy series, um, it specifically parallels... <laughs> The, the Mormon plan of salvation. So prior to the creation of the earth in heaven, there was a point in time. Well, actually, we need to go even, even before that. Their early pioneers said that Christ came into, be, had a beginning. They'll say he wasn't created, but he had a beginning. <laughs> but it was so far into the distant past that it basically is eternal. And so after that point, there was the creation of the angels and, and heaven And at a certain point after that, the Father called together the heavenly host to make the announcement that Christ was going to be made equal with himself, taken into his councils. This council had to do with the plan of creating the earth. In doing this, Lucifer became jealous. This was the domino that led to Lucifer becoming jealous. So he started, they'll try and point to things like Ezekiel and say, well, he was filled with pride. Doesn't say anything about because Jesus was exalted to be made equal with the father, etc. Let me comment. Even even Ezekiel 28, 11, 19, their butchering of it. Yeah. Says he was in the Garden of Eden and he was perfect in all his ways. So that's after creation. Yeah. So So, they try and pin that on prior to the creation of the earth. It can't be. Ezekiel yeah. 28, 11, 19. So, hey, Bible pervert in a box. I'm going to use your standard against you to bury you. So when we go and have a discussion, be ready for these questions. Ezekiel 28, 11, 19 does not mention Satan, doesn't use the term devil or Belial. That's an assumption you're reading into the text. And secondly, it says he was already perfect in the Garden of Eden. The Garden of Eden came into existence after the earth was formed. So this passage will bury you in your fake prophetess. Ellen G. White. So I just want to, that's why I want you to explain, because I'm going to now use the same standard against them. You want exactitude? I'm going to demand exactitude, you sons of the devil. But go ahead. Well, that's exactly correct. They inconsistently use this standard of show me one verse, show me. And it's like, dude, if you do that with the majority of your guys' system, it completely topples your whole foundation. The great controversy completely topples because none of this stuff is found in scripture. Not just that, but it's damnably heretical. Yeah. False, false God. That's not even real. But nevertheless, that's essentially where. So um, Satan rebelled 
and became the enemy. Yeah, Lucifer God rebelled and became Satan. Exalted Christ to be his equal prior to God entering his Sabbath rest, right? Yes, because the Sabbath rest of creation, again, this is where they have an inconsistency because they try to say, well, the Sabbath is eternal. Angels are keeping it in heaven, which, again, like Chrysostom points out here um, uh, regarding Mark 2, we're going to see later this completely backfires on them because Isn't it says right? the Sabbath It says the Sabbath was made. made. That's not eternal. And it was made for who? Man, Man. not angels. Isn't that right, brother? When I said that this is Israel Sabbath, they misquote Mark 2, 27 to 28 against me to say, no, the Sabbath wasn't just made for Israel, it was made for men. But you see how you bury yourselves, you Bible butchers? Because now that very text shows you the Sabbath wasn't made for angels because angels are not men. So they were not observing Sabbath. It was made specifically for man to observe and it was made. It's not eternal. So now just to get just to get this correct, because I'm challenging as you're doing this, I'm because I know that Bible pervert in a box is going to try to respond. So, hey, Bible pervert, here's my challenge. Show me from Scripture, because you follow Sola Scriptura, where the angels <clears throat> were observing the Sabbath before creation. Show me from Scriptures, Genesis 1, verses 1 to 31, does not include the creation of the angelic realm and the sphere of heaven where angels dwell. And show me from the Scriptures that Satan rebelled before the creation of the Genesis 1 account, which you do not take to include the angelic realm. So you uh, making my challenge is very clear to you. And if we have to do a part two, we will. So Bible pervert in a box, I need you to show me where the angels were observing the Sabbath before the creation of this realm. I need you to show me that Genesis 1 excludes the creation of the angelic realm that sphere we call heaven where angels dwell. It's only referring to the universe. I want you to show me these things so that you don't assume it. And then I want you to prove from Ezekiel 28, 11, 19, that there the king of Tyre is Satan. Don't infer it and don't be appealing to authority. Show me because we're going to use your exactitude fallacy to bury you and your fake prophetess. Now go ahead, brother. Not just that, Sam, but they also run into a number of issues because Ellen White's commentary on that, which, again, according to their statement of confidence in her writings, which is far more authoritative than this Greg guy. He's a nobody. It doesn't matter what he says. What matters is what the GC has said, the General Conference, because Ellen White taught that the General Conference in session is being led by the Holy Spirit and is infallible. And in their statement of confidence in the writings of Ellen G. White, they claim we uphold our conviction that her writings are divinely inspired and correcting of inaccurate interpretations of Scripture. They do not replace the Bible. Rather, they uphold the normative character, a.k.a. they're the infallible interpreter, which they've said verbatim elsewhere. Um, and they correct inaccurate interpretations derived from human reason, tradition, etc. So it, her commentary on Ezekiel, get this. She claims, she goes on, I think it's in uh, Patriarchs and Prophets, which is one of the big three that in Selected Messages, Book 3, page 122, paragraph 2, she claims is barricaded by a thus saith the Lord. So she claims that Lucifer was the choir master in heaven, which I've heard other people speculate around. Yes, Lucifer it was involved in music, etc. But she goes on to say he could sing every note across the spectrum at the same time he had the most beautiful voice and he had a massive brow ridge showing that he was wise beyond, you know, all these other angelic beings. An angel that has a brow ridge. This is their physicalist worldview coming in. So Satan in their system, angelic beings are like the stereotypical angel. They have a, a physical body that looks like a human with wings. So Satan, Lucifer, looks like a human being with a brow ridge. And has wings like that. That's what's going on with this whole thing. But just an interesting uh, little yeah, aside there regarding Ezekiel. So Bible pervert in a box. We're going to challenge you. Show us from scripture. Yeah. Where Satan has wings and he has this brow ridge that your false prophetess says Jezebel, daughter of Satan, taught. Because I'm going to nail you when we go live if you don't get cold feet and hide. So we're going to see what I'm going to do to you because you think you know scripture and you don't. But go ahead, brother. Yeah, let's bring the video back up and, and get, get going. Go to the early church. They'll say, see, that's our point. You contradict the Bible. You go against the Bible and the example of the Jewish followers of Jesus who kept Sabbath. And you run to Gentiles 
who became more and more anti-Semitic, anti-Jewish, to spite the Jews to prove your case. I think what Sam's talking about is the origin of Sunday as the Lord's Day. It's believed by some scholars the reason Christians started observing the Lord's Day on Sunday was to distinguish themselves from the Jews because of anti-Jewish sentiment in the Roman Empire. There were a number of anti-Jewish laws passed by the Roman government and occasional outbreaks of violence against the Jews. So Christians, to distinguish themselves, changed their day of worship to Sunday to avoid being the target of anti-Jewish sentiment. One of the earliest records of this is the Didache, written in 90 AD or later. Chapter 14 of the Didache instructs followers to assemble on the Lord's Day, also called the first day of the week, for breaking bread and thanksgiving. Okay. The anti-Semitic argument. Yep, exactly. You've got to be prepared for this one. So we're going to look at the primary sources now because this guy is just, he, sh he should change his name to Bible Parrot Box. Be well, no, so something else because then it sounds like he's parroting the Bible. He's literally just parroting all the SDA talking points, Sam. Here's the issue with this. They have to dismiss historical sources such as Ignatius's epistle to the Magnesians where he says any friend of Christ ought to keep the Lord's day. He says, keep, keep the Lord's day. Precisely. This is early second century, long before their conspiracy theory that Pope Sylvester I and Constantine conspired to change the Sabbath in the fourth century. And, and that uh, Pope Sylvester I gave Sunday the imposing title of Lord's day. So notice Adventist pioneer J.N. Andrews, who the, the current sitting president of this organization, we just looked at this a couple weeks ago. This guy's a flaming anti-Trinitarian heretic. And the pre sitting president of their organization says, quote, he is the greatest biblical scholar our church has ever produced. Let's look at a quote now from this guy in his book, History of the Sabbath, which is what all of these jokers are parroting. Andrews, like I said, was the, for the foremost SDA Sabbatarian theologian of the pioneers and was also a Christological semi-Aryan heretic. Notice what he asserts, if we can bring up the slides here. Yes, yes. And when you're done, I want to comment on Didache because he buried himself. But go ahead. Yes, we're going to talk about that. So notice, this is what Jay and Andrew says in his book, History of the Sabbath. This is the central claim of the SDA church. Okay? Quote, We have proved that the Sunday festival in the Christian church had no sabbatical character before the time of Constantine, meaning it wasn't seen as a rest day. We also have shown that heathenism in the person of Constantine first gave to Sunday its sabbatical character and in the very act of doing it, designated it as a heathen and not as a Christian festival, this establishing a heathen Sabbath. It was now the part of popery authoritatively to affect its transformation into a Christian institution, a work which was not slow to perform. Sylvester was the Bishop of Rome while Constantine was emperor. How faithfully he acted his part in transforming the festival of the sun into a Christian institution is seen in that by his apostolic authority, he changed the name of the day, giving it the imposing title of Lord's day to Constantine and Sylvester. Therefore the advocates of first day observance are greatly indebted. The one elevated it as a heathen festival to, uh, to the throne of the empire, making a making it a day of rest from most kinds of business. The other changed it into a Christian institution, giving it the dignified appellation of Lord's Day. It is not a sufficient reason for denying that Pope Sylvester, not far from AD 325, authoritatively conferred on Sunday the name of Lord's Day to say that one of the fathers as early as AD 200, 200 calls the day by that name and that some seven different writers between AD 200 and AD 325, Tertullian, Origen, Cyprian, Antiolus, uh, Victorinus, uh, yeah, Marius Victorinus, and Peter of Alexandria can be adduced who give this name to Sunday. And F grade, do not pass go, collect zero dollars, straight to jail. Constantine did not enact a heathen Sabbath or a heathen festival. And it's funny that he mentions origin, Sam, because after saying it was Constantine that gave the, the first day its sabbatical character, this is straight up false. When mentioning origin, notice, folks, what origin says, and it can be referenced to show he never, or um, it, it can be referenced to show that uh, prior to Constantine, there's zero support for Sunday having a Sabbath-like character. So notice, this is origin. 
his homilies on Numbers chapter 4, written 220 AD, so over a hundred years before Constantine and Sylvester even existed. What does Origen say in his sermon preaching through, sorry, uh, Numbers 23, or no, it is, it's, it's homilies number 23 on, on Numbers 4. What's he say? Quote, on Sunday, none of the actions of the world should be done. If then you abstain from all the works of this world and keep yourselves free for spiritual things, go to church, listen to the readings and divine homilies, meditate on heavenly things. Can you make this stuff up, folks? Jay and Andrews didn't know what he was talking about. This is a hundred years before Constantine even existed, but he supposedly gave the first day its, its Sabbath-like character. And this is the guy, Jay and Andrews, that 90% of Adventists are regurgitating, whether they know it or not. Because this is the case, you'll then hear them say this ludicrous stuff like, Ignatius was a heretic, That's the, or, or that the epistle to the Magnesians is a forgery. The fact is, it has nothing to do with hating Jews or Gentiles mainly taking over. It has to do with new creation, something Bible flop box and SDAs know nothing about, and then dismiss as a Roman Catholic invention. But furthermore, Greg, you contradicted your prophetess who holds more authority than you and claimed that the change came with the Pope, not with any early Gentile Christians wanting to distinguish themselves from the Jews, but also he mentioned, like you said, Sam, the Didache claiming that... Uh, that, the, that it's the origin of the Lord's Day when no, Revelation 1.10 is. And they can't deal with the fact that the Lord's Day, Kyriake Himera in Greek, is not Sabbatismos or any variation of such. To deal with this, they have to point to where Jesus said he is Lord of the Sabbath. And then they'll say Lord's Day in Revelation 1.10 is the seventh day Sabbath. But this is what's called illegitimate totality transfer. It doesn't look at the grammar, which is the indicator that the Lord's Day is something different than the, sab the, the seventh day. John had a multitude of ways that he could communicate that if he wanted, and he didn't. So those are the problems that I saw in that that period. Sorry, I know that was a little bit there, but what do you want to say about the Didache? Yeah, well, here's the problem. Folks, I want you to see what he just admit. This is why I say it's his funeral services. He just admit to you, the Didache, he dates it 90 AD. I'll go with that. I'll go with 90 AD. That's in the lifetime of John the Apostle, the Didache. I want you to hear him carefully. That's why I know this guy won't join on a neutral platform. Here, I'll come on his channel. So he doesn't make, call my bluff, Bible pervert in a box. I'll come on your channel, decimate your satanic doctrines by the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. And call my bluff. I don't want you to hide. I'll come to your channel. But I want you to hear what he said, guys. Pay attention. Listen to what he had said. He said, oh, did it came 90 AD. At first, he went on this rant saying, it was due to anti-Jewish sentiment and the Christians persecuted the Jews and this is why they wanted to then change a Sabbath Sunday out of their hatred to Jews. But wait, he just quoted the Didache in 90 AD. Last time I checked, Judaism was a religion accepted by the empire. You could be a Jew and worship the God of the Hebrews and didn't have to sacrifice to gods and goddesses and Rome would leave you be. But at the time... If you were a Christian, because this was considered a new sect, didn't have any power, you were forced to recant Jesus by swearing by the gods and goddesses and sacrificing them, or you would be murdered. How could the Christians in 90 AD have that kind of power to persecute Jews when the government, the empire, was against them, killing them, and the Jews actually were given license by the empire to worship freely and not sacrifice to the gods and goddesses when it would have been the Christians who would have been handed over to imperial persecution by the Jews, not the other way around. And I'm going to prove it to you. I'm going to use scripture to prove that this guy is a son of the devil. He doesn't know scripture. Brother, I don't know if you can screen share. I'm going to show you. In the book of Revelation, written around the time of Didache, the Lord Jesus talks about Jews who are not really Jews, but are liars who are the synagogue of Satan harming Christians, not the other way around. Yeah, I know. If you can open up for me, Revelation chapter three, yep. verses seven to nine for starters. And let me know when you want to put up the screen because I don't know how to screen share. That's fine. Let me just uh, get it zoomed in here. So it's nice and large for people to be able to read. Here we go. You're talking about the church of Philadelphia, right? Revelation 3, 7 to 9, right? Uh, and there's yeah. also Revelation 2, but let's look what he says. 
So who's persecuting who? Now watch this Bible pervert. He thinks that he follows Jesus and he's trying to defend the Jews against these Christians. He just showed that he's of the devil and not of Jesus because here, let me read Revelation 3, 7 to 9. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, write the words of the Holy One, the true one who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens. I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door, which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power. See, they had no authority, Bible pervert in a box. Do I say you're a son of the devil? You don't know your Bible any more than Ellen G. White, who's in hell, knew her Bible. And this is supposedly their favorite book that they're a master of. Oh, but now he got mastered by the book he thinks he mastered. Glory to Jesus. Ellen G. White's God and judge. Now, look, I know that you have but little power. And yet you have kept my word, have not denied my name. Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not, but lie. Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet and they will learn that I've loved you. Yet he's defending the Jews against the Christians when Jesus is defending the Christians against the Jews who reject him and hate him, who are persecuting Christians. Now, another one, brother. Go to Revelation 2. I see you're smiling. Yeah. Brother. Yeah, because I know where you're going. <laughs> Revelation 2. Now we're going to read Revelation 2, 8 to 9. Look at this. Yeah. Oh, wow. Their book, huh? The one they like. Revelation 2, 8 to 9. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, the words of the first and the last who died and came to life. I know your tribulation. Ouch, this guy just proved he's a son of the devil. Good job, buddy. I know your tribulation, your poverty, but you are rich. And the slander of those who say they are, that they are Jews and are not, but are synagogue of Satan. Who do you think they're slandering? The church. So who's persecuting who? The Jews are persecuting Christians, not the other way around. Burial, moreover. The Didache is written in the lifetime of the apostles to the churches of the apostles. He just pretty much buried his religion because he just admit in the Didache, a document written, when the apostles are alive, because John was alive, that the custom of the churches established by the apostles was to meet on the Lord's day, not on Sabbath. Damn, I thought you're trying to refute me, Bible pervert in a box. But go ahead, brother. Well, it, you just you make a number of interesting points there, and there's kind of a lot that I, I could obviously say, but um, it, this is one of their favorite arguments to try and use. So. We did a, a six hour, two parts, three hours each on the platform responding to Doug Batchelor, somebody that you have yeah, uh, 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 spoken of too, brother. Go ahead, be yeah. before. And he tries to use, he goes through all the standard arguments. This is one of them. And he essentially shoots himself in the foot as well, because at the end of the day, they're contradicting their prophetess when they say this. They had a guy by the name of Samuel Bakioki. He was a, one of their scholars that basically was sent out on the mission with the thesis of trying to find the change, quote unquote, of the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday earlier than Constantine, because they knew the problems that things like Ignatius's epistle, epistle to the Magnesians and the Didache provided. Samuel Bakayoki, after years and years, they some SDAs had to end up just dismissing him because they were like, he's a secret Jesuit because he went to the uh, Gregorian school in Rome. So he was actually a Jesuit that tried to infiltrate the movement. That was the excuse because he came back after like years and years and years. And in his thesis paper basically said, well, I couldn't find it. <laughs> and so then SDA started to say, well, he's a Jesuit. That's why he was a secret plant. That was the excuse because they've tried everything. Well, then one of the other things they'll try to say is, well, Sunday came about because while uh, Christians didn't want to be anti anti-Semitism was taking over and Christians didn't want to be associated with Jews. And so as a way of evangelizing, they shifted to a different day to try and win people to Christianity so that they weren't being won to something that people couldn't stand, which was Jews. So they'll try and pivot it off of like, well, it wasn't necessarily that these Christians were anti-Semitic. It's that society was anti-Semitic. And so as a way of trying to evangelize to people and win them to the faith, they changed the day of worship so that people didn't feel like they were affiliating with Judaism. <laughs> but like you showed here, it, it's completely backwards. It makes no sense to say 
they basically, here's their claim that Gentiles just took over like crazy and the Gentiles had it out for Jews and basically didn't want to be associated with them. And then they'll erroneously point to, again, things like Ignatius's epistle to the Magnesians, not understanding they didn't hate Jews. They hated Judaizing. Precisely. Which Paul hated Judaizing too. Read Galatians. Paul hated Judaizing. Paul right. said, I hope their hand slips and they emasculate themselves exactly. um, because of what they're what they're doing. So they, me, they just conflate what's actually being done and, and say, well, they hated Jews when no, they hated Judaizing. Let me add another comment about Ignatius because this is their burial service again. So Bible perv in a box. Uh, make sure you let your audience know that Ignatius is the bishop of Antioch, Syria, who is an eyewitness to the apostles who was trained yeah. by the apostles. He even mentions the wisdom of Peter and Paul and that he's nothing in comparison to them. On his way to being martyred, this is another thing, because he's saying, oh, the Christians are persecuting Jews. Ignatius is on his way to being martyred, yeah. being fed to the lions, to the beast. And he begs the Christians at Rome not to intercede and stop him. He wants to die willfully as a martyr, because that's how much he loves Jesus. May the same spirit that filled them fill us to love Jesus the way he did. Ignatius mentions that the Christians trained by the apostles would meet on the Lord's Day Sunday. So now Bible pervert in a box, you're going to need to explain and not top dance how you have two first century sources. Well, Ignatius is writing at the start of the second century. The yeah. dates of his epistles are attributed between 107 and 112 AD. But still, he's a witness to the first century church. Why? Because he's been a bishop of the church in Antioch, Syria, in the first century, and he met the apostles and they trained him. So that's why I say two first century sources. Ignatius is first century. He's martyred at the start of the second century. But he's first century. He's a disciple of the apostles, the bishop of Antioch. And guess where they were first called Christians? In, in Antioch. Antioch Acts 11.26. Yeah. So now Bible pervert in a box. Can you and your cult followers explain how is it the very eyewitnesses of the apostles, trained by the apostles? Because Didache, you admit, even by your dating, is 90. Written in the time of the apostles, written to the churches of the apostles. How is it you have two first century sources confirming Christians are meeting on the Lord's Day and worshiping Jesus on the Lord's Day, Sunday, not on the Sabbath? This is why I said you're a joke and you won't debate or have a dialogue because you'll get humiliated. Go ahead. He's going to make the same argument that their scholars do. There's kind of twofold thing here. Well, one, Bible Flockbox is out of sync, not just with his prophetess, but with who his church's president says is the best biblical theologian their church has ever produced, J.N. Andrews, who he didn't say it goes back to the Didache. He said the title, the imposing title of Lord's Day goes back to Pope Sylvester and Constantine, which oh. is long after the Didache. So Again, it shows that they're grasping at at straws. But right. second off, they're going to use this argument, Sam. So you have to be able to, which it's easy to, to extinguish if you understand. But he's going to try and claim, well, I don't care about those traditional sources. I care about the biblical text. Okay. The only place Lord's Day is used is Revelation 1.10. They're then going to say, to determine what that day is, we have to know, uh, or we have to go to where Jesus says he is Lord of the Sabbath. No. Well, Lord of the Sabbath, is the seventh day Sabbath. So therefore Lord's day has to be the seventh day, but see that's illegitimate totality transfer. Yeah. That's not how that works. That's not looking at the grammar. And sure. so when you look at the grammar, that's what proves it's not the seventh day Sabbath because there's specific grammatical language that John would have used if that's what he's referring to. So that's the argument more than likely. Yeah, he's going to well, make. Let me or, he, from another angle. Let me what, real quick, just real quick here. One other thing you may get, which I don't know about with him, but again, some of them will say, oh, Ignatius was a heretic. Uh, well, <laughs> then that means they just blaspheme the very God of the scriptures they follow. So you just made my case. Okay, let me bury that argument. I won't even need to. I won't even need to go that far to show that the Lord's Day in Revelation 1.10 is a Sabbath because that's not the term used in reference to Sabbath observance. What I would say is, one second, I'd say, hold on. You don't care what the tradition says, but you go with the biblical text. But Bible pervert, you don't know what the biblical text is apart from that tradition. The very Bible you have was given to you through the agency of these very men and women. The very men and women that we're citing 
that gathered together on the Lord's day, not on Sabbath, the very men and women whom God empowered to become unconquerable because the pagan empire and heresies could not vanquish them. They were preserved by the spirit to preserve the scriptures, to preserve the church, the very scriptures that now you use against them. So you can have your cake and eat it too. You can have your cake and eat it too. Because when you say the biblical text, my first challenge to you is Bible pervert in a box. How do you know the canon of scripture? Where do you find in the Bible a list given by God delineating the inspired books that make up the rule of faith? You don't have it. So how do you know Revelation is scripture? Because if you're aware of your history, there were actually some individuals who questioned whether Revelation is canonical and whether it should be in the canon. Same thing with 2 Peter, same thing with Hebrews. So how do you know what the biblical text is apart from the very tradition that you just rejected? You see why I say you need to close shop. You need to go and find you something else to do. Go sell cars, wash windows, go drive Uber because you're a joke, like your cult is a joke, because you can't have your cake and eat it too. You cannot appeal to the biblical text because that begs the question, because you don't know what the biblical text is apart from that tradition. And if Ignatius is a heretic, you just show you don't believe in scripture. Because Jesus, our Lord, said that the apostles would appoint bishops who by the same spirit in them would empower their successors to know the truth, explain the truth, pass on the truth, and preserve the truth. In fact, if you don't mind, brother, let's look at some of those promises. Are you ready? Yep. That's why we'll do uh, two parts if you want. We're no rush to this. But you see, this guy's stupid. I don't care what tradition, biblical text. You don't know what the biblical text is apart from the tradition. You idiot. That's why I'm politically incorrect, but you're a nice guy. Okay. I want you to go to Acts 20, 25 to 32. Open up for us. Acts 20. Because I'm going to show you. He just showed he doesn't leave the very biblical text. Because that biblical text tells me Ignatius cannot be a heretic. Especially what verses? Who died as a martyr who was an eyewitness to the apostles. Here, Acts 20, start at 25, read to 32. Okay. Acts 20, 25 to 32. And now, behold, I know that none of you, uh, none of you among whom I have gone about proclaiming the kingdom will see my face again. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all. For I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own hold blood. Hold on, hold on, my brother. The Holy Spirit appointed the disciples, these elders that the apostles taught. He appointed them to do what and how to do it? Reread that again in 28. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. Keep going. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, and from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. LNG white. Yeah, twisted things to see people. Go ahead, yeah. Slow Therefore, down. be alert. Yes, bro, I love you, man. Slow down, man. You ain't watching. Okay. You don't believe in a rapture. You're a post-mill, dude. Keep going. <laughs> Therefore, be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish everyone with tears, and now I command you to commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Okay, first promise is the Holy Spirit appoints bishops to succeed the apostles, who are taught by the apostles directly, to now carry on the work of preserving the flock from false teachers like Ellen G. White. But let's look at other statements so we can go. This is why we'll probably do two parts. It's so fine. It's okay. Yeah. I'm not in a rush to destroy Bible pervert in the box. John now, 14. No, go to Matthew 16, 18. Okay. Watch here. They don't believe in the Bible, guys. And they don't know the Bible apart from tradition. Matthew 16, 18. Well, real quick, Sam, it's actually interesting that previous pericope we were looking at because they're going to tell you, see, see, it, it, it affirms what they teach, which is basically there was apostolic Christianity. Then there was a great apostasy. The church was completely lost yeah. and just gradually degraded and great degraded what they'll call a, a church deformation. Yeah. And then Luther came along and it just like was 
gradually now being reformed, leading to a restoration, which yeah. they believe they are. So yeah, they're going to point yeah. to that and say, well, see, it, it says that so, after the apostles will leave, there'll be people that come in and the whole thing will just completely go off the rails. Is that what the yeah. text said? No, but it, it, that actually ends up proving too much because even in time of the apostles, there were heretics and heresies that split the church. So that means the apostles failed too. First yeah, right. Chapter one, first Corinthians one, you don't need to turn there because I already know the arguments. That's not going to fly with me. First Corinthians one, 10 to 17. Paul is already talking yeah. about divisions among Christians. He even mentions that in first Corinthians chapter three, verses one to 10 and first Corinthians 11, 17 to 19. And even John and first John and second John and third John is talking about false Christians Antichrist already arising and leaving from their midst. For example, yep. in 1 John 2, 18 to 19, he talks about many Antichrists have gone into the world and they were from us and they left us because they were never of us. Because had they been of us, they would remain. But their falling away shows they were never of us. Talking about Antichrist. So if these idiots think that because there were wolves <clears throat> flourishing at the time of the bishops appointed by the Spirit through the apostles, to prove that the church is corrupt. That means the church was corrupted even in the time of the apostles. So they now either blaspheme Jesus because he was too weak to preserve his church or he lied because he had no interest in preserving his church. This is what happens when you put the Bible in the hands of these Bible perverts. No. Not just that, but 1 Corinthians also says if that were to happen like they said, 1 Corinthians, Paul clearly says the gospel and it did go out to the whole world. Yep. So if it... Flushing. If the, Yeah, right. and if that were the case, then it, it, it did that, but a great apostasy happened. Okay. Yeah. So now other promises that the church will not be vanquished so that in spite of wolves, they'll be true servants of the Lord, preserving the faith. So in, in Matthew 16, 18, does Jesus say he will be building a church or he's going to take a vacation and wait for LNG White? Yeah. What does Matthew 16, 18 say? Uh, not that that's going to happen and we're going to need uh, these anti-Trinitarian, yeah. anti-gospel yeah. heretics to come along in the 19th century and now just deem themselves to up and be the church arbitrarily. And I tell you, you are Peter on this rock. I will be building my church. If you look at it, it's I will be building my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. But these Bible perverts are telling you the gates of hell did prevail because from the time of the second century onwards, Church, the church became pretty much apostate and needed to be restored, thereby blaspheming the very Jesus that these perverts say they follow and <clears throat> malining the very scripture that they claim to follow. So that's the second promise we saw, right? Now, John 16, yes. 12 to 13. I just want to show them the promises. That's not going to work. It's not going to cut it. Bible pervert in the box. Yeah, because God, the spirit will lead into all truth. John 16, 12 to 13. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak of his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. Now, did you catch it? He will guide you into all the truth. They'll say, oh, but that's just the apostles. That promise wasn't for those who came after. Baloney. This is not just a promise for the apostles, Bible pervert in a box. Because we're going to go to 2 Timothy 1, 13 and 14. Yeah. 2 Timothy 1. 13 of 14. Is the Holy Spirit only going to guide the apostles or is he going to guide their successors? 2 Timothy 1, 13 of 14. Do you want to read Follow that? the pattern of the sound words that you have heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus by the Holy Spirit who dwells within us. Guard the good deposit entrusted to you. Oh, wow. So the Holy Spirit will be working through the successors of the apostles, empowering them to know the truth, preserve the truth, and defend the truth. Till the end of the age. Wow. Yeah. How about 2 Timothy 2, verses 1 to 2? What will Timothy then do with it? 2 Timothy what? It answers theology. Can I debunk you and send you the hell out of here? Because you want me to now change the topic because you're a bastard, tool of the devil, on whether Miles Calvinism, visible church, is right or wrong. So let's change the focus of this session because you are a spiritual bastard who wants to cause division. Now go to... The other channel, and don't come back, answers theology, because you're answering nothing. Get the hell out of here. Sorry, brother, because they're manifesting because you're a Calvinist. All good. Second Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 to 2. Uh, Christian Ninja, why don't you come here so I can take that shooting star 
and stuff it down your throat and be a man and see if you can defend your heresy. I'll get you the link if you're more man than LNG White was. Will you come yeah. up and debate us? I'll give and you this, the link. This, that, that person wants nothing to do with Deuteronomy 5, 12 through 15. It's going to backfire on them. That's actually going to come up in our presentation, so we'll eventually get to that. But uh, if that person wants to step up and be the, uh, the yeah, example to... Here, so to, I can do to you what I'm going to do to your friend, Bible Pervin Box, I'll be more than happy. But here now, guys, focus on the promise. 2 Timothy 2, verses 1 to 2. The promise isn't just the Spirit will guide the disciples. The Spirit will guide disciples and then those successors that the Spirit appoints through them. And he's going to work through them because look what Timothy is told. The same spirit that was in Paul is in Timothy, empowering Timothy to preserve the deposit of faith. Now, Timothy is exhorted to do what with it? Second Timothy 2 verses 1 to 2. You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus and what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses and trust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So I want everyone to understand these passages, the promises. Remember Matthew 16, 18. John 16, 12 to 13, Acts 20, 25 to 32, 2 Timothy 1, 13 to 14, 2 Timothy 2, verses 1 to 2, and then finally Matthew 28, 20, where Jesus says, Jesus says, Matthew 28, 20, and lo, surely I am with you always, even till the end of the age. Now, I don't think they interpret that to mean the destruction of Jerusalem, right? They believe the end of the age means the end of the world? Correct. So you now you just buried yourself, Bible pervert, in a box. Because you take this to mean that Jesus will be with the church, with the followers, till the end of the age, which means a second coming per your interpretation of this text. That means that Jesus will never fail to have true believers empowered by the Spirit to safeguard the correct interpretation of scriptures and those scriptures and defend them. Not he's going to take a break in the second century and wait till LNG White is born. Therefore, if I look at the pattern, Ignatius appointed by the apostles, meaning the spirit was working through Ignatius. Didache written to the churches at the time of apostles mean it's reflecting the sound teaching that the spirit want the churches of the apostles to uphold, which includes the Lord's day, not Sabbath. You guys are a joke, but continue, brother. On this exact verse, Sam, I can give you the official exposition from the SDA church, from their own exposition of their own fundamental beliefs. We were going to get to this later, but we may as well do it now since it's up on screen. Here's the other reason that this verse absolutely and utterly proves that this is a cult. This is not the same uh, Jesus as what Christians believe. So they can see it. This is the official exposition, as you see in the, the, the bottom corner there, down here, of their own fundamental beliefs. This is on their chapter four, God the Son, with Matthew 18 or, or, or 2820 as one of the texts that's utilized, but listen to this, okay? This is how they answer that Jesus says, Lo, I'm with you always. Quote Jesus asserted his omnipresence with the assurances, Lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age, Matthew 2820, and where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them, Matthew 1820. Although his divinity has the natural ability of omnipresence, the incarnate Christ has voluntarily limited himself in this respect. He has chosen to be omnipresent through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. John 14, 16 through 18. Close quote. Hmm. This is coming from their pioneers who did not believe the Holy Spirit was a person. They are pneumatological heretics. So it wasn't until uh, eight, the 1880s, toward the end of her life, that Ellen White herself became convinced that the Holy Spirit was actually a person. She went from teaching and believing that the Holy Spirit wasn't a person to believing that the Holy Spirit, I'm getting into this, by the way, uh, this Thursday on my channel, the funeral service for the SDA pioneers, where we will be doing a mega stream going over quote after quote after quote after quote with the thesis question of this is who God used to, to restore his church that never fell away. This is the, these are the people that the triune God used people that didn't believe in him to restore his church supposedly. So it's kind of in the same vein, but <clears throat> they're pneumatological heretics. And Ellen White went from not believing the Holy Spirit was a person to believing that the Holy Spirit has a form just like Jesus does. 
because that's what they mean by person. So when they say they believe God's three persons, they mean Father, Son, and Spirit are three tangible, literal forms. We looked at that the last time I was on here. So the Holy Spirit, she says, walks around on the earth, but he's invisible. So he's a physical being and has a physical body with legs. She says he's walking around the earth, but he can't be seen with the human eye. But he's physical, but he has a physical body, but it's invisible. <laughs> so that's where they've that's where they've evolved to now from not believing the Holy Spirit was even a person to uh, it was just the presence of the father and the son in their physical absence. And Jesus limited himself in his omnipresence. He was given that in his exaltation. When he was exalted in this pre-earth origin story, he was made equal with the Father, and one of the things that he was given was omnipresence. She then goes on to say that Satan rejoiced when man fell because Satan then knew that Jesus would have to incarnate, and by doing so, he would lose some of the stuff that he was given in his exaltation. Darn, man. By the way, brother, we will have to do a part two because we're, we're going to do two hours, and I'm free anytime this week or next week do part two because i know we're not okay. going to go through all of it because obviously because we already took over an hour just to go through these tidbits and we haven't even gotten to meet in there so brethren yep. lord willing we will do at least a part two if we have to do part three because thoroughly decimate this guy and i'm going to repeat my challenge i'll come to your channel call out you fangirls of bible pervert in a box i will come to your channel so you can have all the authority to block me or to mute me when I decimate your false religion for the glory of Jesus Christ and use these arguments against me. Let's, so let's proceed. Yes. I was going to say, now he's going to get into Israel Sabbath versus God. Tell Sabbath. me how you prove your case. Catholics, Coptic, Assyrian Church of the East. Man, I hate my voice. Darn. Orthodox. I'm going to show you prove your case. Are you ready now? Give it to him, Sam. This is the answer all Sunday keeping churches have been waiting for for thousands of years. Here's the answer. You say, we do keep the Sabbath. We do keep the Sabbath. But we don't keep Israel's Sabbath. We keep God's Sabbath. That was the answer all Sunday keeping churches have been waiting for all this time. Not to mention, there is no such thing as Israel's Sabbath. The Bible never calls the Sabbath the Sabbath of the Jews or anything like that. Over and over, the Bible calls it the Sabbath of the Lord your God. It's His Sabbath. It belongs to Him, not the Jews. It never did. I told you theological acrobatics are coming, didn't I tell you? What do you <gasps> Again, Israel's Sabbath is a colloquialism. It, it, it's simply distinguishing between God's rest and the Sabbath day, which, yes, Greg, the Bible delineates between both. Yes. As he is going to actually recognize, ironically enough, and contradict himself in a little bit, Sam. Gotcha. He's going to contradict himself. If you want to play that part, then we can decimate him. The catch of yeah. what he's saying, right? He's going to end up agreeing with me, thinking he's refuting me because he's going to admit there's a distinction between the Sabbath that God personally observes and the Sabbath given Israel. And if you guys actually listen to me, when I say Israel Sabbath, unless you are a demon acting like a Mohammedan or you want to twist words, it's clear what I meant. The Sabbath that Israel had to observe, which God does not observe unless he believes, yeah. every seventh day, God takes a break. And then at <clears throat> sundown evening, he then starts sustaining creation again. You see how dishonest they are? But well, go ahead. It just, it, it, it's hard to even take serious. It's just like, it's so remedial. It's like, do you not think, Greg, that people have maybe, just a thought here. Do you think that maybe people that came before you guys have actually read these passages? Do you think maybe they're aware of these passages? He just asserts these things like, I don't know. It just maybe I've listened to too many of these people for for too long to the point now where it's like I just almost feel insulted the way that they talk yeah, exactly. to you. Why do you um, think I'm agitated and angry? Because yeah, I respect someone who will accurately represent my point and try to steel man me, not straw man me. Even when I deal with those I disagree with, I try my best by the grace of Jesus Christ to steel man their position, not straw man. See what I mean? To make their argument the way they would make it if they were arguing not attack straw man. Anyone who has any decency and anyone who thinks that he serves the God of truth would know what I was saying. Israel's Sabbath means the Sabbath day assigned to Israel. 
unless he believes that God is also observing the seventh day every week like him, so that he starts working and sustaining creation Saturday evening, but then he takes a break front Friday evening, because remember the Jews, their Sabbath is from evening to evening. So their Sabbath, Saturday begins Friday evening, right? Evening to evening. Yeah. So unless this Bible pervert in a box wants to say, oh yeah, God starts the Sabbath with us on Friday evening, and then he resumes his work on Saturday evening, and then takes a break the next Friday evening. Everyone understood what my point was. The Sabbath that God is continually observing till the end of the age is not the Sabbath that Israel had to repeat every week. I mean, basic, right? But go ahead, brother. Yeah. What do you mean? Well, he's going to continue on this here. So get here them to admit that the Sabbath days of Israel and the Sabbath year was modeled after God's Sabbath day. Israel's Sabbath, their Sabbath, Sabbath days and Sabbath years modeled after God's Sabbath. Where am I getting this from? There is no Israel Sabbath. You don't find that phrase anywhere in the Bible. It's just God's Sabbath. There were other annual Sabbaths, which were part of the feast days in the ceremonial law, which Christians don't have to keep anymore. But that's a subject for another video because we're not talking about the Who annual says, Sabbaths and the ceremonial law way, here. Who said that uh, Christians don't have to observe it anymore because his ipse dixit, because he says so, his prophet. You see how selective they are, right? Yep. They will choose what Sabbaths you keep, you don't keep. Because they don't keep a Sabbath year. The same God who told Israel to keep a Sabbath day said keep the Sabbath year. But see, notice, they're the ones who decide which of the Sabbaths you keep. Did you catch that, right? What's going on here? But go ahead, brother. I'll tell you what the argument for that is because it's in my notes here. And we'll actually bring up, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what verse they try to utilize to support that. And in doing so, they end up shooting themselves in the foot big time. But again, folks, what we got here was the verbatim fallacy. We don't get the phrase Israel Sabbath in the Bible anywhere. Again, Greg, I think that's his name, Greg. It's a colloquialism. It's another way of saying the Sabbath day in contrast to God's Sabbath, like Sam said, which, yes, I will demonstrate is in Scripture. But, Greg, show us the phrase investigative judgment in the Bible, okay? Show us national turned international Sunday law. Show us the mark of the beast will be Sunday worship. Go ahead. Let's see it. If you're going to use the verbatim argument outward toward others, don't shoot yourself in the foot and not be able to hold the same standard consistently. In the same vein of inconsistency of making one argument one place and not realizing it backfires in another, this is what I was talking about, Sam. He claimed that we're not bound to the ceremonial law anymore. Yet the SDA church, including Greg, upholds the food laws of Leviticus 11, oh. only selectively though, not the command to kill anyone that touches anything unclean. Oh. These laws were ceremonial. Tithing was also ceremonial. Sam, notice what the SDA church, call, uh, they'll call this systematic benevolence. Oh. They teach we're still under tithe. Not just that, but here are a few things that Greg's prophetess, Ellen White, claimed regarding tithing. Can you share that tab? Yes, brother? sir. Notice, Ellen White claimed that tithe the sacred reserved by God for himself and is to be brought into his treasury to be used to sustain the gospel labors in their work. She prescribed that it is to be used to pay ministers and SDA Bible workers, teachers of educational institutions, missionaries, and retired gospel workers. Hey, Greg, show us that in scripture where it says the tithe that was for the priest is to be used for these uses. On the contrary, she gave counsel on a larger list of things the tithe should not be spent on. Show us this list in the Bible, Greg. The poor and the needy. She said it's not a poor fund. Helping pay the education of a student. Operating expenses of schools. The expenses of a local church. Missionary work in new places. Charity and hospitality and other benevolence purposes. But it doesn't end there. Claiming to be shown all of this by God. Some of the more outlandish and heretical assertions she made regarding not paying tithe include, you might not make it to heaven, God won't bless you, God may not answer your prayers, you lie to the Holy Ghost like Ananias and Sapphira, it's recorded in your heavenly record, you must confess to not paying and pay up, the Lord will reduce your income, young children must also pay tithe, you're not worthy of eternal life if you don't pay it, you'll be cursed by God if you don't pay it, You'll be reduced to poverty. You'll receive a curse. 
You shouldn't be called a Christian and you're not worthy of prayer when you're sick. Greg, show us that in the Bible because that is ceremonial too. That was ceremonial law as well. Hmm. So Greg, he doesn't think we're under the ceremonial law anymore. Furthermore, Sam, the Day of Atonement was a part of ceremonial law per Leviticus 23, 26 through 32. And they don't believe that Christ's day of his passion was the antitypical day of atonement. Oh. They teach the antitypical day of atonement started in 1844 when the Adventist Jesus began the investigative judgment in heaven. It's been going on since then as this long drawn out period, meaning that aspect of the ceremonial law also isn't fulfilled yet. And they're still under it. So he's either too ignorant of his own system to see how what he's just said causes death blows to it, in which case he has zero business popping off online, or he's being deceptive. Because what they try to use to support this is Colossians 2 to say the certificate of death that was nailed to the cross was the ceremonial law. You know how they arrive at this conclusion? They claim there's two laws. There's Moses' law and God's law. Oh. Moses's law was given to God for Moses to put in a book and he wrote it on parchment. God's law was written by his own finger on stone in the Ten Commandments. And those were housed inside the ark. The book was housed outside of the ark. So they will go to Deuteronomy 32 to say that Moses wrote the handwriting of ordinances in a book and put it outside the ark, showing a distinction between God's law inside and Moses's law outside. They then say Colossians 2, when it says certificate of debt, is talking about the book of ordinances, which was the ceremonial law that Moses wrote down. The only problem being, uh, no, the book of the law contained the entire Pentateuch, which means it included it included the Ten Commandments two times. Because the passage is not saying that uh, the ceremonial law was nailed to the cross. That's not what's being said there, but that's the argument they're going to try to use to say, well, the Bible does teach we're not under ceremonial law anymore. And that's where they're going to point to try and support but it. Brother, since you mentioned Colossians 2, I don't know if we'll come up and if we'll address it later or in part two, but I want to show you how this now buries them. Okay. Because he, he remember what the brother told you is that they're going to reference Colossians 2 14, where the written <clears throat> code of charges the written charges against us was nailed to the cross. And so I see that's the ceremonial law. And this passage is also butchered by them because if they read in context, it actually now does away with their Sabbaths. Why? If you can open up Colossians 2, look, let's use that yeah. very passage. Watch here, guys. This is the passage he's referring to, Colossians 2.14. Ironically, in Colossians, Paul takes things in the Old Testament, yeah. such as physical circumcision, and shows how they're now applied under the new covenant of our Lord, New Testament, not in the way as observed by those under the Mosaic covenant. What do I mean? If we go to Colossians 2.11, watch here. Let's read the context. Look how this is going to bury them. If you go to verse 11, now watch here. In him also you were circumcised in union with Christ. You were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. You were not physically circumcised. So when the Lord circumcised, it wasn't with physical hands. He put off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. So Christ circumcised you, not with physical hands, that evil inclination that ensnares you, having been buried with him in baptism. So what was physical circumcision, now in the new covenant, is now <clears throat> ascribed to your physical baptism, your union with Christ in baptism, right? in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. Now watch this, because this is the passage that these Bible perverts quote, and they don't know it backfires against them. They even mistranslate it or misinterpret it. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses. And here's the verse that they apply. See? These are the ceremonial aspects of the law. By canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This is how they're misinterpreting, right? Ceremonial laws, this is it? That's yep. a fact. But now watch the burial, my brother. You but know they're going to quote, they'll only quote it in the King James because it says handwriting of ordinances. It's okay, man, because King James, uh, man, you're making my day. Because now watch what happens 
What's now canceled, brother? Watch. Look at the burial. It's what happens when you pervert scripture and don't read in context. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Now watch the burial, 16. Let's read 16. <laughs> you see that word, therefore? That means now he's going to bring because up of. the implication. The implication of what Jesus has done. Therefore, because Jesus did this, took that written code of legal demands and nailed it on the cross, thereby disarming the powers of darkness and bringing legal charges against you. Let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. Meaning, do not let anyone condemn you for not observing these practices anymore, which includes the Sabbath. <laughs> yeah, and not just that, but notice it says it does weekly, monthly, and yearly. It's festival, new moon, and Sabbath. Now, Sam, their argument is going to be you have to use the King James because they're going to claim this gets translated. Change it. Change it. They're going to say, because they're going to say the King James says Sabbaths, plural. Beautiful. And, that, Even better. and they, they claim that that makes a difference because in this translation, the ESV, for example, it only says Sabbath, which makes it look like the weekly Sabbath. But no, they say, Sabbaths, brother. But they say Sabbaths, plural indicates it's a uh, ceremonial Sabbath. no sabbaths plural mean all the yeah. sabbaths assigned plural yeah. so i want yeah. it to be plural brother yeah but also you know the other thing that backfires on them when they say yes. that here's how you could translate paul then if that's what paul was saying therefore let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a festival you see, but see, the whole point, though, even with the King James, brother, they can say Sabbath's plural. Last time I checked, that means every Sabbath that was ordained. Yeah, they try to say it means uh, Sabbath's plural means ceremonial Sabbath. But they don't understand the whole point that Paul is getting at here is the Jewish eon and those things that were associated with the Jewish eon, the old creation included. That's what's out of the way here. So it. Th this sort of gymnastics around, well, the plural S, no, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. It doesn't change the fact of the point that he's making. This verse also actually buries this guy as well, because I've seen some other videos of him where he's railing against infant baptism. And uh, this verse actually decimates them because they'll try and argue sometimes. Uh, there's no connection between circumcision in the old and baptism in the new. Um, but yes, it is right here. Paul clearly says that, like you pointed out, that what was done to a person in circumcision in the new covenant is done to a person in baptism. And nowhere has God said that the covenant sign is to no longer apply to the children of believers. So it was to apply to children of believers before. It's still yep. to apply to the believers of children now. Because Correct. you don't circumcise females, but you do baptize. Yeah, females. they were seen through the headship of their fathers. Now, yeah. just to let, let me repeat. When they tell you, no, the Sabbaths, plural, mean ceremonial Sabbaths. Say, that's not the distinction that Paul gave. He didn't make that distinction. By saying Sabbaths, plural, Paul means weekly, yearly, all no. Sabbaths. He didn't make your qualification. So I want it to be plural because Colossians 2 decimated you, you Bible pervert, in a box. Greg, go do Lyft or Uber. Teaching the Bible is not your cup of tea. You're even more of a tool of the devil than Ellen G. White, because you even go against her own interpretations of passages as faulty as they are. But continue, brother. Yeah, let's bring the uh, the video back up because now he's going to get into the seriousness of breaking Exodus the Sabbath. 20, Exodus 20, verses 8 to 11. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it sacred. Why? You are to labor and do all your work for six days. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to Jehovah your God. You must not do any work. Neither you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your slave man, nor your slave girl, nor your domestic animal, nor your foreign resident who is inside your settlements. For in six days, Jehovah made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them. And he began to rest on the seventh day. That is why Jehovah blessed the Sabbath day and made it sacred. So you catch it? Your Sabbath days, Israel, and Sabbath years are modeled after my Sabbath day. My Sabbath day, which is the seventh day when I rested from my work of creation and entered my Sabbath day. 
I don't see where Sam is coming up with this distinction. There is no Sabbath day of God and Jewish Sabbath. There is just one Sabbath the Lord instituted and commanded Israel and now Christians to keep. Is that clear? Is what I'm saying making sense? Let me know in the comments section down below. Another one. Yes. Exodus 31, 12 to 17. Jehovah said further to Moses. Jehovah said further to Moses. Speak to this wife. Yeah. Sorry, I, I didn't realize. Yeah, but you guys, isn't it ironic? He just read it in front of his eyes. He read it in front of eyes. And this is the second text. He goes, uh, comment section. So the fanboys can say, yeah, I know. Okay, did you guys see in Exodus 20, 8 to 11? God said that just like he created the heavens and the earth in six days, rested on the seventh, you too should rest on the seventh day. And he doesn't see a distinction? Um, maybe I'm I'm a little slow because, you know, I'm bald and, uh, you know, when I have a cheat day, I can't function normally. But, brother, maybe you can help me. Isn't it clear in the passage we just read that God says you are to keep the seventh day for just like the Lord your God created the heavens and the earth in six days and rested on the seventh day, you too work six days and rest on the seventh day. And obviously there's a distinction between the way God worked in six days and his day of rest from theirs. Am I missing something or maybe I'm the one who's slow? No. And part of the problem is, and again, we'll, we'll get to this actually in a minute because um, there's like a, a minute left of this timestamp section. So I'll, I'll save it for that. But that's, that's exactly correct because they don't have a biblical theology around the Sabbath. And what I mean by that is they don't have a Genesis to Revelation big picture view. They've basically microscopically zoomed in on one aspect of redemptive history missing the forest for the trees and then they overextend that so far to the point that it's like this eternal thing there's like a divine characteristic to what we call saturday these types of things but notice what he's going to say in response to you here it's and tell them especially you are to keep my sabbaths plural not one for it is a sign between me and you during your generations right <clears throat> in order that you may know that i jove am sanctifying you you must keep the Sabbath. You must keep the Sabbath, for it is something holy to you. Whoever profanes it must be put to death. If anyone does any work on it, then that person must be cut off from among his people. Six days work may be done, but on the seventh day is a Sabbath of complete rest. It is something holy to Jehovah. Anyone doing work on the Sabbath day must be put to death. Now notice 16. The Israelites must keep the Sabbath. They must observe the Sabbath during all their generations. It, it is a lasting covenant. Now, why? Because verse 17, guys, verse 17. It is an enduring sign between me and the people of Israel. For in six days, Jehovah made the heavens and the earth. And on the seventh day, he rested and refreshed himself. Now, did everyone get it? Arthur, everyone. Yeah. Israel's Sabbath days and Sabbath years were modeled after God's Sabbath. So what is the true Sabbath day? God's Sabbath or Israel's Sabbath? They are God's Sabbaths, not Israel's Sabbaths. Oh okay, Sam. Oh, boy. So you know what's fascinating about this? And I've mentioned this a couple times. We had that person barking in the comments earlier, ninja, whatever. They will never cite Deuteronomy 5 and the second giving of the law on the subject, yes. which is where we see another key aspect of the Sabbath. Exodus. Folks, Deuteronomy 5, 12 through 18, the command changes the yep. ceremonial form of it changes yep. it's not rooted in remembering creation but redemption god leading his people out of slavery in egypt which like i said i'll talk more about in in a second but this is an important point to always remember with this group because their lack of paying close enough attention to this change is actually one of the dominoes leading to their death kneel yep so did you want to bring that up but before you go on let me explain, which should have been obvious, why I kept saying God's Sabbath is the true Sabbath. Israel's Sabbaths are not the true Sabbath. He goes, they're all God's Sabbaths. No, really. I didn't know that. Thank you for telling me that. Let me expound on it. This is why these people get me upset and I have no mercy. I treat them the way the prophets and apostles treated Bible butchers, false teachers, not because I'm an apostle. God forbid I would be that arrogant to think that way, but we are to imitate them. The prophets and the apostles did not treat Bible perverts kindly. They would call them up because they're dangerous to the soul. They'll mislead people and damn them to hell with a false gospel. That's why you can't 
just play patty cake with them. So now if he was honest enough and a man of integrity and could represent my arguments correctly, I would cut him some slack. It is clear what I mean, the Sabbaths of Israel, meaning those assigned to Israel to keep. Let me repeat, the Sabbaths assigned for Israel to keep that God himself does not keep. The Sabbath that God keeps began after creation and is ongoing. Secondly, why do I keep saying it's the true Sabbath? Because the passage is right in front of this guy's eyes. You see Colossians 2, 16, 17? Here's where I get that it's the true. Here, let me show you some pattern. If we can take a few minutes to unpack. Why do I say true? Not saying it's false, but it's not the archetype. It's not the prototype. Here. Yeah. Where am I getting language? Look at 17. Let's read 16, yeah. 17. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come. But the substance belongs to Christ. This is why I kept saying true because Israel's Sabbath observance is a shadow of the reality from which it's modeled. And this is not the only time. We're going to look at a few references. You need to listen to this. The earthly tabernacle is said to be a shadow of the true one. Brother, if you can open up Hebrews 8. Yep, 8, That's 1 where and I'm 2. I'm getting it from. Hebrews 8. This language, I'm getting from Scripture. Hebrews 8, if you can read 4 to 5 for us, what does it say? Okay, yeah. It's funny, I was just in this earlier preparing for some content because they love this pericope because they think it supports their investigative judgment. Now, if he were on earth, he would not be a priest at all talking about Christ, since there are priests who offer gifts according to the law. They serve a copy and shadow of the heavenly things. For when Moses was about to erect the tent, he was instructed by God saying, see that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown you on the mountain. Oh, so the earthly tabernacle is a shadow? Correct. Now, what's the true one? If you can open up Hebrews 9, read for us 22 to 25. So if you were honest and you're a man of integrity and you claim to serve the God of truth, you would not misrepresent me, but shame on you. That's why the Lord's going to rebuke you as he is, because he rebukes liars. Now, in Hebrews 9, 22 to 25, what does it say? Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Thus, it was necessary for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these rites, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has entered not into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, the but, true into heaven, things. Oh, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God now, on our behalf. Before you move on, I need them to catch it. So Jesus entered not the copies of the true things, he entered into the realities of which the earthly counterparts were shadows. I'm using biblical language. True things. And then what does 25 say? Nor was it to offer himself repeatedly as the high priest enters the holy places every year with blood, not his own. Now, For then, here's, okay. you can stop at 25. now, here's another one. Where am I getting true Sabbath? You know, shadow of the true Sabbath. True tabernacle, shadow of the true tabernacle, the realities, the true things in heaven, of which the earthly counterpart are shadows. I'm getting it from Scripture. Now, let me give you another one. If you go to John 6, 32 to 33, watch what Jesus says about the manna, and then we continue from there. What does he say? John 6, 32, 33. Jesus then said to them, <clears throat> Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Oh, so Jesus said true bread in contrast to the bread that Israel ate in the wilderness. True tabernacle in contrast to the earthly tabernacle. The true things that are in heaven of which those on earth are merely shadows. Do you guys see why I'm using that language? Yeah, one more, just one more. Can you go to John 1, 9 and see what Jesus is? Yeah. Whoops. John 1, 9. Sorry. John 1, 9. Watch here. Are you seeing the pattern, Chris, everyone, where I'm getting the true Sabbath, the shadow, true tabernacle, the shadow, the true priesthood, the shadow, true sacrifice. 
I'm getting it from scripture here. Who is the true light? Look at Jesus, right? What does it say? Correct. Which gives light to everyone was coming into the world. So he's the true light. But in Matthew 5, 14 to 16, the disciples are said to be the light of the world. So are they fake lights? No, but they're not the reality. He is the archetype. He's the yeah. source of which everything else is a shadow. What did you not get? Bible pervert in a box. Now you can continue, brother. There's yeah. something interesting here really quick, and then we'll get back into the video. Um, we could go deep on this motif as well of the true light and the true things. Eusebius brings this out in his commentary on Psalm 92, which is a psalm for what? The Sabbath day. <gasps> Ah, and Eusebius brings out this same exact point that you mentioned earlier. The Jews met from evening to evening because in the uh, typical, it was in the darkness to the darkness. Whereas in the new creation, yes. we meet and gather on the first day at the dawn of the first That's day like when the new light, the true Amen. sun, the true light shine forth out of the tomb after the work of redemption was accomplished. Now let's get back into this clip here because now he's going to so, totally. Brother, let's go another 24 minutes, make it two hours, and we'll come back and do a part yeah. two. Guys, we will do a part two, God willing, this week when the schedule allows. So we'll see. Go ahead. Cool. You bring the video up. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought yeah, I'm oh, just like, like, because I'm like shocked how bad his arguments are. I thought he'd be more honest. The seven day Adventists, they don't have a way to refute you. Uh oh, I'm shaking in my boots. Genesis yeah, 2, yeah. verse 1 to 3. Thus the heavens and the earth and everything in them were completed. And by the seventh day, God had completed the work that he had been doing and he began to rest on the Sabbath day, seventh day, from all his work they had, that he had been doing. From all his work that he had been doing. And God went on to bless the seventh day and to declare it sacred. For on it, God has been resting from all the work that he has created, all that he purposed to make. I don't know if Sam realizes this, but this goes to show that the Sabbath was instituted before there were ever any Jews. At the time it was instituted, only Adam and Eve were in existence and they were not Jews. The Jewish nation came from Abraham. That's why Jesus said in Mark chapter 2, verse 27, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. This points us back to the institution of the Sabbath on the seventh day of creation week. God instituted the Sabbath and gave it to mankind, which consisted of Adam and Eve at the time, and intended it to be a blessing to his followers from that time on. Okay. What a so real quick, real quick, Sam, if, if I can, I, I have to silence this. I have uh, some slides that will go with this as well. This yes. should not take very long. Um, and then you can you no, can no, no, say no, what you need to. Time. I want you to take most of the time, but because he's refuting me, I'm having to chime in. If he wasn't refuting me, I wouldn't chime in, honestly. He said, folks, you have to grasp this. If you Listen grasp this, yeah. you will utterly... I brought this up to an SDA pastor a few months ago. I literally witnessed him short circuit before my eyes. He, he didn't know what to do because he knew what I was saying was correct, but he had no way of trying to get around it because the SDA church is not prepared in this regard. He said Genesis 1 and 2 shows the Sabbath was instituted before there were any Jews. Except, Greg, you clearly don't realize that God's seventh day in creation wasn't man's seventh day. <laughs> it wasn't man's seventh day. It was God's. Man was not there on day one, two, three, etc. When you point this out to them, like I said, they will short circuit. But back to what Sam said regarding Israel's Sabbath being modeled after God's Sabbath. This is the evidence of such. Notice first, notice the creation week. It was based on evening to evening. So days were counted based on evening to evening. Man's first day was God's seventh day. Catch this. Man's first day was God's seventh day. He was fashioned and prepared on day six, which was what for Israel, Sam? What was day six? You're muted. Uh, for day six of Israel, well, they worked six days, and on the seventh, they would rest. But what was it called? The sixth day? Preparation day. I'm sorry, brother, because, yeah, you threw me off a little bit because they're like, what do they call it? I'm like, hmm, you got me on that one. You're good, man. Day, I'm, I'm not debating you. <laughs> day day six was, day six was preparation. preparation day for Israel. That was not arbitrary. 
that was also modeled after God who prepared and fashioned man on six on day six, preparing him to begin the week in holy communion with him before then going out to fulfill the command to take dominion and subdue the earth. Notice the order of events on day six, folks. You have the creation of land creatures in 1, 24 through 25, the creation of Adam, the creation of the garden. God then gives instructions to the man. God brings the animals before the man to be named, followed by a desire for him to have his own mate. The creation of Eve, more instructions from God, and then ending the day with the declaration that it was very good. Adam did not experience the evening of day five. Eve was fashioned later in the day after a number of, uh, of things that Adam did like in, in the preparation, like God was also preparing. But Adam was paralleling God as his image bearer. So Eve most certainly didn't experience much of anything on day six. So based on evening to evening, which SDA scholarship agrees is the proper way of counting, man's first day was God's seventh day. Which is why, when we look at redemptive history, and that the Sabbath is rooted in creation in Exodus 20, redemption in Deuteronomy 5, and rest in Genesis, Exodus, and Deuteronomy, we see that the Lord Jesus, the, the, the second Adam, came and did what the first Adam failed to do, redeemed the creation that fell, making a new creation, accomplishing that work, and then entered his rest after it was complete, just like God in creation. Only he didn't enter his rest in the new creation on the seventh day. He entered on the first day when he walked out of the tomb, having completed the work. So notice God in creation. We were just talking about type and shadow and substance. God in creation did a mighty miraculous work. He accomplished that work and entered his rest the seventh day. He has remained in that ceased state since the finishing of creation. But God in redemption, in the person of Christ, because remember, Exodus is rooted in creation. Deuteronomy is rooted in redemption. These are all types that are pointing to the ultimate antitype. In redemption, in the person of Christ, God comes and does a mighty miraculous work, accomplishes that work, and then enters his rest, but on the first day. So he reorients man back to his pre-fall disposition, where the church, God's people, now starts our week back in holy communion with God before then going out and subduing the earth to his glory, furthering his kingdom. This is what Hebrews 4, 1 through 11 is explaining, which um, probably in the, the next session, we have about 20 minutes left here. I don't know if we'd be able to get through all that, but this is what Hebrews 4 through 11 is explaining, which, like I said, we will look at later um, or whenever we do, because Bible Flockbox twists this to his demise. But this is the kicker, folks. They don't realize when they point to creation, it backfires on them. It was not man's seventh day. It was God's seventh day based on evening to evening, even according to their own scholarship, the first day for man would have been God's yeah. seventh day. So everyone understood the point, right? If they're created on the sixth day, that means their first day would be the seventh day because they're coming into existence on the sixth day. And so now they're resting on the first day because they're in the garden. So you understand they're, what Yeah. Mean? They're starting out in holy communion with God in right on relationship. And God prepares them on preparation day. And then Adam on preparation day is following God's orders as his image bearer. He's also doing a preparatory work That's before right. entering into holy communion with God. So yeah. when Is Israel, when day, Israel, right? correct. And when Israel comes along later on and they have day six, which is preparation day, they're supposed to take two times worth the manna and because they're not going to be able to gather it on the seventh day. That is also Israel being taught by God paralleling God in creation. So it doesn't even just go to the seventh day where Israel is paralleling God. They're also paralleling him on day six, preparation day. So Jesus is the second Adam comes and restores not just the relationship that, that sinners now can have with God, but in, in restoring all of the creation, he restores back the right orientation that man was in prior to the fall. Yep. Now, I want to add something to why he just destroyed himself. So from what well, I understand his point, understand what he said, but I'm going to add something. Understand the point he's making. From what I'm understanding him to be saying, understand how he just buried himself and he proved my point. It's going to come full circle if you understood. But I'm going to ask him to see if I understood his point. 
He's saying that the seventh day was being observed by Adam, Eve, and everyone else, even before the Mosaic Covenant because of Genesis 2. Is that what he's saying? Yeah, they're saying that, and, and not just that, but ultimately because it goes back to this pre-earth origin story where apparently days are happening and angels are, are keeping every seven days as well. So just again, so we be clear because you know what their position, because I don't really care about this dude, but I just want to show you now, guys, he now ends up proving my point. We come full circle. Why? So to understand his point, I just want to make clear. When God instituted the seventh day and then Adam and Eve were created, Adam and Eve, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they're all observing that seventh day? That's their claim, yes. Okay, now do you understand how that buried him, brother? You know why, right? Well, he also cited Mark uh, Mark 2, which we were talking about earlier. Yeah. And uh, there at the end. this buries him, not Mark 2. How? Genesis 1? Yeah, well, he, because if I'm going by what you're saying, Genesis 2, he's arguing that this means they were all observing the Sabbath from even before the time of Moses, right? Because this is the Sabbath. Is that what he said? So I just want to make sure. Yep. Yep. That's okay. what they, yep. So you understand how that buried him, right? Uh, Yes. In a, a, actually, a, a number of ways. Well, because it doesn't verbatim say what he's been saying previously is the no, standard. No, go with it what needs to be saying, verbatim. Bro. No, no. Go with what he's saying. Do you know how it buries him? Uh-uh. How else? It means he just made my case that every day is a seventh day for the believer in Christ. Because if they entered the Sabbath, that means that Sabbath for them was every day because there was no evening, no morning. So if they were experiencing God's Sabbath, that means he just made my case. Since God's Sabbath began and doesn't end, that means every day is God's Sabbath. That means we're going back to the Sabbath observance of Adam and Eve, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, which has no end, it's ongoing. He just made my case. Yeah, and they have a whole, because again, that poses major problems for them as to why the seventh day is not capped with evening and morning. It doesn't pose problems for us. It's very simple. <laughs> because no, again, it's... it's it, saying, because it, you're it's, telling it, me, so that's why I keep repeating. I don't want to misrepresent their point. Because if he's saying this is the Sabbath day and it was instituted before Moses and so they were observing it, well, nowhere will you find in Genesis where they work six days and then on the seventh day, they observed it and repeated the cycle. So that won't, that means if they're observing the Sabbath, that means they're observing the Sabbath of God, which is every day, not just once a week. He just made my case. I wish we were going to get to the, the Hebrews 4 section tonight. I really yeah. do, because what he says there is just, oh man, it's... Uh, because yeah. he tries to he tries to use an argument that will work on a lot of people if they don't if they're unbecoming because he's going to point they're going to try and point to the word sabbatismos okay and the fact that God's rest in Hebrews is actually the word kataposis which I agree uh, I have a commentary set the set right there all of those are all on the book of Hebrews um, but. Uh, all of that to say, I wish we were going to get to that tonight. We probably well, won't. I don't know how, but, how much time we'll take, but, but the point is, even if we do it at part two, I don't care what terms he thinks the text use. The context is clear. It's referring to Genesis 2. So even it, if, Go ahead. I was just going to say, the reason I say that is because they think it's a home run argument, Notice and it. most people are not equipped on it, and it actually backfires on them severely. Yeah. Backfires on them severely. So, Let's uh, play this. This next, because we have 13 minutes here. Let's play this next section. The way because I was editing to, this video. Because it has to do with you specifically, not me. All so right. we need to hear you because he tries something, a pretty pathetic argument here. Notice what he says. I discovered that Sam is quoting from the New World Translation of the Holy Scriptures. This is the Jehovah's Witness Bible. And it's a well-known fact that the Jehovah's Witnesses intentionally changed this Bible to suit their doctrine. So my question is, why would Sam be using a corrupted version of the Bible to try to prove his points? That is humiliating. To support its beliefs, the Watchtower organization has published its own version of the Bible called the New World Translation. To lend credence to this translation, the Watchtower Society has deliberately misquoted a number of well-known Greek scholars. Dr. J.R. Manti, an eminent Greek scholar, was one of the authorities quoted out of context. 
The Watchtower Society has implied that he supports their New World translation. Dr. Manti disagrees. I have never found any so-called translation that goes so far away from what the scripture actually teaches as these books published by Jehovah's Witnesses. They are so far away from what there is in the original Hebrew and the original Greek. Dr. Manti called the Jehovah's Witness Bible a shocking mistranslation, obsolete and incorrect. You can't follow there's because it's uh, biased and uh, it's deceptive because they deliberately changed words in a passage of scripture to make it fit into their doctrine. They distorted the scripture in many passages, scores and scores of passages in the New Testament, dealing with the deity of Christ especially. Now, so he intersparses this in there, Sam. Gee, oh. And, that, and, that. and had an, while he's editing film, because it's like the scene changes, and he realizes, he's like, oh man, I could include this in there. Jeez. Sam Shimon. So his claim is this guy's using the Jehovah's Witness Bible. So Sam Shimon, the Jehovah's Witness destroying apologist, apparently using the New World Translation. Yeah. Sam, do you use the New World Translation? Because you may not understand or remember the discussion that you're having with the individual that he's sure. uh, reviewing, oh, I but I do. So I want to hear you first, yeah. and then I'll tell you why you were uh, quoting from that. Yeah. Well, in the first place, I don't watch. I don't like to watch myself, hear myself. But if anyone has been following me regularly, regularly will know, I will often use the very translation of the people, the groups, the cults, <clears throat> endorsed by them, against them, in order to show from their own sources of authority the refutation of their lies and their heresies. So when I use a Jehovah Witness Bible, it's to equip the Christians to show them where in the Joe Witness Bible you can go to to destroy their heresies. Because even here, when he's quoting the late Manti, he's not saying that there is no passage in the Joe's Witness Bible that has been translated correctly. That means he's a liar because he's taking a snippet out of context. What Dana Manti is saying is there are places where they mistranslate to agree with their position, but that's not in reference to the entirety of the Bible. I'm not aware of any Bible, even those produced by cult groups, where they don't translate many verses accurately. It's those passages that affect their position, Trinity, deity of Christ, person of the Holy Spirit, salvation that they tamper with. But what has that got to do with Exodus 20, 8 to 11? Can he show me where in that translation of the Joe Witness Bible they mistranslate it and goes against what he would accept as an appropriate rendering of the Hebrew? He also demonstrates, Sam, that he is a dishonest person. Greg, you are a dishonest person. Sam was destroying Jehovah's Witnesses that stream, yep. which is why he was citing from that. And you're pulling a clip in from a person who called in after Sam was destroying Jehovah's Witnesses. That's why he's using it, not because you believe, which is rather rich. This guy has zero business criticizing Jehovah's Witnesses even for having a for having a false Jesus when he himself has a false Jesus. But not only that, brother, Charles Taze Russell was influenced by the Adventists. Yeah, they, they're kissing cousins. They both came out of Millerism, the original Advent movement, and were heavily influenced regarding the nature of man, soul sleep, these sorts of things, off and on one another, as well as Jesus being Michael the Archangel. So it's not a one-to-one -one on that area. They're a little bit different, but not really because the way Ellen described Jesus early on, she talks about him winging his way to heaven and like she uses all these things that sound like, uh, well, ain't an angel. And by the way, um, brother, did you know in that very documentary, the one he said, I'll link to it later, they even say that Charles Taze Russell was influenced by the Adventists. It's in that very documentary. It's a documentary sure. about the origins of the Jehovah's Witnesses where Charles Taze Russell came under the influence of the Millerites, of the Adventists, because he had lost his faith because of the Trinity and eternal conscious torment. Now, yeah. brother, what we'll do, I'll extend the time. Let's go through Hebrews 4 since you want to do that. Can you get there? 
Uh, absolutely. So in the next section, there's only one section between that and and Hebrews four. Well, he talks about he talks about spiritualizing the Sabbath. Um, we I don't really have a, with the true and the thing. I mean, yeah. So yeah. so and then he and then actually I take that back. There's one other small little section where he we he he talks about is every day the Sabbath because you say that every day is is God's Sabbath, okay. and so he he comes back and argues that we kind of already talked about that. But then we get into Hebrews four. So yeah, let's do that. do that. Because let, I know let's do that. Because those. yes, because I'm telling you folks, so the this seven week, really just Bible, 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 but, 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 the seventh day of the week, Saturday. So how does that apply to you and me? Let's go to Hebrews four. Let's break it down. Verses one to seven and then eight to 11. Hebrews four, verses one to seven, eight to 11. He's hitting us with Hebrews 4. I should have seen this coming. Oh. Everyone who tries to say that Jesus is our Sabbath rest or every day is the Sabbath now likes to misinterpret Hebrews chapter 4, which I assume he's going to say next. Hebrews 4 verses 1 to 7. Therefore, since the promise of entering into his rest remains, God has promised you must enter my rest, which is the word for Sabbath. Let us be on guard for fear Someone among you seems to fall short of it, fails to enter God's rest. For we have also had the good news declared to us, just as they had, by the word that they heard, right? But the word that they heard did not benefit them. Why didn't benefit them? Because they were not united by faith with those who listened. So they didn't believe. They didn't believe the gospel was preached to them, so they didn't enter God's rest. There's a couple of things I'd like to mention real quick. First of all, Sam is wrong in saying that the word rest in Hebrews chapter 4 verse 1 is the same word for the Sabbath. I double checked just to make sure. The word rest in Hebrews chapter 4 verse 1 is translated from the Greek word kataposis and is a metaphor for the heavenly blessedness in which God dwells and of which he has promised to make persevering believers in Christ partakers after the toils and trials of life on earth are ended. Now, there is a verse later on in verse 9, which uses the word sabbatismos for rest, which is equivalent to the word Sabbath. But verse 1 uses a different word for rest. Also notice the rest spoken about that God offers to New Testament Christians was also offered to Israelites in the Old Testament. And there is no indication that this was supposed to replace the commandment to keep the Sabbath for the Israelites. God's rest, which he offered the Israelites, was not meant to replace the Sabbath day. It was meant to complement it. The rest that God offered the Israelites and offers Christians today is spiritual rest. It's a state of peace and tranquility that comes by being fully satisfied by God. But that doesn't negate the need for physical rest, which the Sabbath day offers. Okay, now Sam, I'm going to talk a little bit here. Greg, you can say everyone that appeals to Hebrews 4 makes the same argument, which is why, Greg, I challenge you to a publicly moderated debate on this pericope of Scripture on a neutral platform with equal amounts of time and an agreed upon format. Let's see if everyone uses the same argument with Hebrews 4, okay? Because they don't. This is where my apologetic is going to vary slightly from Sam's, like I mentioned earlier. But in substance, this is the key, in substance, we are saying the same thing, which is ultimately what matters. I simply take it a step further, which causes irreparable harm to the SDA church's position. So let's set it up, Greg, mop the floor with me and show up with, with verse four that talks about the creation week and verse nine using the word sabbatismo. So that means it's talking about the seventh day Sabbath still being binding. As we will look at momentarily, this backfires on you badly, Greg, because I agree, kataposis is the Greek word that's used for God's rest and sabbatismos is what's used for Sabbath rest, which shows the author of Hebrews has two rests in focus. But because this guy is just parroting SDA talking points and hasn't worked through the text himself, he makes a serious blunder. A blunder that I will explain. Um, well, no, we'll end up we'll end up doing it here. But he contradicted himself here, Sam, quickly before looking at that. He contradicted himself. Earlier, he said the Bible doesn't talk about God's rest and Israel's rest. It's just God's Sabbath. Yet now he recognized that kataposis is a word that speaks of the heavenly blessedness in which God dwells, which is God's rest. That's what kataposis is translated as in some translations of Hebrews 4, for God's rest. So, 
Uh, that's precisely why uh, he, he has remained in, in that state since the creation week, evidencing that, yes, Greg, God has been in that state since creation. The Bible does talk about God's rest over and against a Sabbath day, the two having a level of connection, but not being identical. One points to the other, and you don't know what you're talking about. He said, notice, the rest that was offered to Israel is also offered to New Testament Christians. He's referring to where it says God preached the good news to Israel in Hebrews 4. That's the gospel, good news. But because of their unbelief, they failed to enter the Sabbath that God offered. Okay? God's rest is not simply experiencing tranquility and peace, Greg. That's not what you guys teach. That's not what you guys claim. There are lost people that experience this to a degree. There's lost people that have peace and tranquility. Hebrews 4 is clear that the way of entry into this rest is by believing. Hebrews 4, 3. The way to enter is by believing. That's how you enter into that. This guy is going to try and go on to say that it's talking about Canaan and Joshua leading Israel into the typical promised land. Not even catching that the entire point of the author inciting the Psalter is that he points out 500 years after Joshua, through David, what did God speak of, Sam? What does Hebrews 4 say? That 500 years later, you're muted. Yeah, I was waiting for you to make that point because you want to open up Hebrews 4. That means there is a rest day for the people of God because he wrote elsewhere, today, if you hear his yes. voice, do not harden your hearts. But he buried but, himself by pretty much confirming that the words are used synonymously. But I'll get there. I'll let you make your point because we're going to open it up. Yeah. This guy butchered his, or, or ended up shooting himself in the foot because he tries to say that the rest that God preached to Israel was actually the earthly promised land because they then went in there with Joshua, even though they didn't go in with Moses. Yet the author anticipates this because the original audience being Jewish converts would have been tempted to think, well, the rest that remains, they ended up going into physical Canaan with Joshua later on. And the author's entire point is that well, if that were the case and that were the true rest that was in focus, why 500 some odd years after Joshua through David did God speak of another day, which remains for the people of God today, which means God's rest can be entered into today by believing the gospel, not hardening your heart, entering into Christ who has physically entered into God's rest ahead of his people. He's physically there. The Sabbath day pointed to that and still points to that. Because again, like I said, I'm a first day Sabbatarian, but I don't mean that the same way that, that they do. That's what the church is celebrating every Lord's day, the Memorial day of Jesus accomplishing re redemption. We're not replacing the commandment. This is a straw man. They are zooming in on one aspect of redemptive history <clears throat> to then try and make that the norm for the whole. Again, the ceremonial form of the fourth commandment changes between the first and second giving of the law which evidences that, yes, Greg, the ceremonial form of the command can change, just like the ceremonial form of circumcision changed to baptism. The seventh-day Sabbath changes in form in the new covenant. The day is a part of the ceremonial form, not the substance, which is Jesus. And the ceremonial form can and has changed. It can and has changed. He claims, so it's in the next section, he kind of rambles on, he claims that the rest that God offers is ceasing from our works and trusting in the finished work of Christ. That's the argument that he tries to use. Except, Greg, you guys don't believe the work is finished. Go look at their fundamental beliefs book, folks. Belief number 24, the investigative judgment. It's called, well, it's the investigative judgment and the sanctuary. They believe that in 1844, Jesus started the second phase of the atonement in heaven. That's to say, it's still this ongoing long process. Like I said, that wasn't nailed to the cross in Colossians 2, even though the rest of the ceremonial form was and the Day of Atonement was a part of the ceremonial law. Um, that wasn't nailed to the cross. It started the antitypical one in 1844 and is this long, drawn-out thing. But furthermore, Greg does not believe that the work of Christ is finished until after he takes the sins of those found worthy of his saving benefits in the investigative judgment and transfers them to Satan who they believe is the antitypical Day of Atonement scapegoat that will bear their sins away and eventually be destroyed with fire and punished for causing people to sin. So no, Greg, you do not believe that, uh, you don't know what you're talking about because what he said, com what you said completely contradicts SDA theology proper. Furthermore, check this out, Sam, if you could share my slides, please. Notice this quote from SDA pioneer, 
Uriah Smith. He was also a Christological anti-Trinitarian heretic who was involved in systematizing SDA theology. Notice what this guy says, Sam. Quote, the death of Christ and the atonement are not the same thing. And this relieves matter of all difficulty. Christ did not make atonement when he shed his blood upon the cross. Let this fact be fixed forever in the mind. Close quote. Let that fact be fixed forever in your mind, Greg. Your movement has yet to denounce this blasphemous heresy that no atonement took place when Christ shed his holy blood. Only a demon would say such a thing in, face of, in the face of Scripture. Furthermore, Greg's prophetess, who they believe was divinely inspired and that Jesus was speaking through her, in Patriarchs and Prophets, a book that she claims was barricaded by a thus saith the Lord, quote, the blood of Christ, while it was to release the repentant sinner from the condemnation of the law, was not to cancel the sin. It would stand on record in the sanctuary until the final atonement. So in the type, the blood of the sin offering removed the sin from the penitent, but it rested in the sanctuary until the day of atonement. Close quote. So despite scripture clearly saying, like we read earlier in Hebrews 9, that without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins, which is why they now have to deal with how Jesus is doing atonement in heaven, yet isn't shedding his blood. They will hypocritically point to Rome and the East, for example, to say they teach Jesus sheds his blood over and over and over again in the mass. Yeah. Yet they don't even realize that they have to have Jesus shedding his blood for sins since 1844 in heaven, where he's still dealing with sin in the second phase of the atonement. And see, did you catch the butchering of Joshua leading them into the promised land? Which, again, yeah. I know we didn't listen to this, this next section. But earlier he said God's rest is the sense of peace and trans tranquility one experiences by coming to God. Then he goes on to equate God's rest that was offered to Israel with the earthly promised land of Canaan. Again, we talked about Psalm 95 and what that says. But Sam, can I share an article from my website? Yeah, where is it? Right here? Uh, yeah, and I'll change the tab here. Sorry, I know I had a, a bit there, but th there's so many things that this guy said that completely contradicts his position outside of just the Sabbath. So these arguments are terrible arguments because they end up just toppling over so many key aspects of your whole system. But folks, the cataposis sabbatismos argument. This is the key, Sam. And uh, let me make my case for it. And then you can have, you know, this would be my final thing here. But you can go to this article on our website, folks, answeringadventism.com. Does Hebrews 4 support the Seventh-day Sabbath? You can type into the, the search bar here. You can click question and answers and scroll down to the Sabbath and find it underneath there. But either way, you can type in any part of this title and it will pop up in the top. But I want to focus on the section that talks about specifically verses 9 and 10, because that is where the kicker is, I guess, 8 through 10. So in verses 8 to 10, the author is going to begin to explain to us what the rest is that's in focus. He says, if Joshua had given them the rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. This is being said, Greg, in contrast to the seventh day. Sam, what does it mean if it's another day? What does that mean about the day that's, that that's being said about? It's not that day. Yep, exactly. So you can argue all you want, Greg, about what day it is. The Bible nowhere says it's Sunday. It nowhere says it's this. You can argue that till the cows come home, but we know for certain it isn't the seventh day yep. <laughs> because another day is being said in contrast to that. So by default, it's definitely not that. But it says this is being said in contrast to the seventh day. Joshua and the Israelites were observing the seventh day Sabbath memorial, Greg. He mentions the seventh day memorial back in verse four and contrasts it here. The author tells us God wouldn't have through the psalmist spoken of another day if there wasn't one. Many commentators will associate the another day with today that's been mentioned throughout chapters three and four, and that is absolutely correct. Today is the day to enter God, enter the rest of God by believing. Today is the day of salvation. Today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts, and so on. But there's also something else going on, as we will see. This is going to tie back to what I was saying earlier about the bigger picture of the Sabbath from Genesis all the way to Revelation. Because it changes in Deuteronomy where the form changes, but the substance is the same. It's now rooted in redemption. So you have creation, rest, and redemption. The rest he is talking about is not the land of Canaan, 
which the reader might be tempted to think, the children of Israel didn't believe God in the wilderness and died, therefore they didn't enter into the rest of the physical promised land of Canaan, which that is true. And he tells us that the land of Canaan is a picture of the ultimate rest, but it's not the ultimate rest, which he explains to us in the next verse. When he says, if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. He's saying, if Joshua, who brought the children of Israel into the promised land 40 years later, was giving them the ultimate rest, God wouldn't have been speaking about another rest that is still to come. Then verse 9, so there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. The Greek word for Sabbath here is sabbatismos, which includes more than just a rest. It literally means a Sabbath rest or Sabbath keeping. There remains a Sabbath keeping for the people of God. To this point, the author has referred to the rest of God as kataposis. Now he uses sabbatismos. Grammatically, they are not identical. He says not only does a rest remain, kataposis, but a Sabbath rest as well. So not only is there a new rest of God entering into Christ, but another day also. There is an eternal rest we have yet to enter, and there's also another day that memorializes this eternal rest. So here's the Adventist argument, which Greg does go on to cite in his, his video. Adventists love to cite verse 4, which talks about the seventh day in the original creation, and then jumps to here, verse 9, and says that because a Sabbath rest remains, it has to be the seventh day Sabbath. But this can't be the case because Sabbatismos, the Sabbath rest that remain, or the, yeah, the Sabbath rest that remains, again, is another day. So it's important to not skip over the in-between verses to see why it was mentioned. There is an order of something bigger being, being presented here. The previous rest of God in both the original creation, Exodus 20, verse 8, and redemption from Egypt, Deuteronomy 5, had three elements that parallel one another. We looked at these earlier. You saw what they were. Mighty act of God. The completion of that work, where he then ceases or rests from that miraculous work and switches to the work of upholding what he has done. And then finally, both of the previous rests of God have a memorial day attached to them as a sign and pledge of the rest of God, which is why verse 10 then becomes pivotal. He that is entered into his rest has also ceased from his works as God did from his, Hebrews 4.10. So the million dollar question, Sam, and I've done... I don't even know how much study on these two verses, Hebrews 4, 9 and 4, 10. The million dollar question is, who is the he that is mentioned? Now, a common interpretation is that this is talking about believers in general entering God's rest. Here is the issue, though, with that interpretation. The he in Greek is singularly plural or sorry, singularly personal, meaning it is a specific individual in reference which is why I think the NASB's translation is spot on, because instead of he, it reads, for the one who has entered his rest has himself also rested from his works. How? As God did from his. So a single individual is being talked about who entered his own rest just as God rested from his works and entered his. That's why it was being mentioned in verse 4. It is a parallel to what God in creation did. The he that enters his rest has to be doing so in a parallel way to God in creation. God finished his works, saw that they were very good, so he ceased and rested the seventh day. If we apply the text to believers, it's necessary that we ask, what works do believers cease from that parallels God ceasing his at creation? Because we can't compare our works to God's works. Our attempts at working for salvation do not compare to God's works in creation, which was a mighty act. The Bible describes the works of rest uh, that we have when we come to Christ, uh, the works that we rest from, they are dead works. Clearly, we also don't take delight in and enjoy our previous works as God did in being pleased with his work of creation, which is what the rest actually means. He was taking delight in his accomplishment. He wasn't tired. We don't rest from our works of sin and then look back over those previous works with delight. So it's not a consistent parallel. The he in verse 10 has to be about someone who did a work comparable to God in creation, a mighty act of one work that was two completed and followed by a rest, a work that is good that he can take delight in. Then when, he, when those works were finished, he ceases from them just like God in creation, and enters his rest 
just like God in creation. The he is talking about Jesus. Jesus did a mighty work of redeeming the creation, ushering in the new creation. He completed that work successfully, and upon doing so, entered his mediatorial rest for his people. The text fits much better when applied to Christ rather than believers. The only thing left to establish is when Christ entered his rest after the works of redemption were finished. So God in creation, seventh day, but Christ in redemption enters the first day from his resurrection, uh, with his resurrection from the dead, which demonstrated the work of redemption was complete. So some will argue that the he in verse 10 doesn't specify Christ. He's not referred to by name. We have to remember, though, that Hebrews 4 is a uh, continuation from chapter 3. In Hebrews 3, 6 through 14, Christ is mentioned by name. It isn't necessary for the author to mention him by name again when the chapter is an outflowing of that same focus. But uh, we enter into Christ by faith, who has already entered uh, into God's rest ahead of us. That's the true promised land believers look forward to, our eternal rest with God. Until then, a weekly sabbatismos remains where we got, gather as the body of Christ to have a little foretaste of the future that we long for as we worship together alongside heaven, communion of the saints, and remember the mighty work that the King, uh, King of Kings, Jesus Christ, accomplished for his people. We have rest for our souls in the gospel and a weekly rest for our bodies until we enter into the eternal rest of heaven. Hebrews 4, 8 really is the death blow to the SDA position, uh, vindicating the church's universal practice of worship, worshiping on the, uh, the new creation Memorial Day. Don't fail to believe the pure, unadulterated gospel and enter the true rest. Now, Sam, I know that that was a lot, but yeah, my it's, argument, it's my like argument. For our brother, we got to slow down so we can follow you, but go ahead. Well, I wanted to be in the interest of time. If people want to look, like I said, they can go to the article. I mainly wanted to get through it to have it on record to tell Greg, if you think, Greg, that everyone uses the same argument, I challenge you to a formal debate. Let's set this up on a neutral platform and let's see if everyone uses the same argument because you using cataposis versus sabbatismos is going to backfire on you terribly because you have to jump from verse four to verse nine and you don't even understand what's being said. The author is making a parallel starting back at chapter three, that Jesus is a better Moses, a better Joshua, leading a better Exodus and a better redemption into a better promised land, is a better Sabbath rest, is a better high priest, all of these things. That's what's being said. Not that, oh, well, the seventh day Sabbath still remains and uh, it, it's verse four and nine are connected that way, which is exactly what they do. So yeah. I'm sorry that I was talking fast. There's yeah, like I, said, I, I was thinking, brother. that's why they I was thinking about the, the yeah. interest of time. So I, I'm sorry about that, yeah, but you can, like I said, go to this article and you can read it more fully. Sure. I just didn't want us to be here for another uh, 40 minutes. So it's sorry all that. That. for uh, just advice in the future. Remember you're yes, not, no, for sure. Yeah. You're not doing this for yourself. You're doing it for others. So when you go slow, they will join because if not, they have to go back and rewatch. So you're going to lose people when you speak. And I'm saying this for your benefit because you're trying to equip people. So totally. I repeat myself several times. So in the future, don't rush because people are not going to catch it, keep up with you. Do them the benefit. You're serving them. You're not doing because you know the material. Do it for the others so they can then use it and refute it. So guys, go back. If you was too fast, some of you got it. Some of you didn't. You're going to have to replay this segment because I know our brother was trying to get to the rapture, even though he doesn't believe in a rapture because he's a <laughs> Presbyterian. But it's OK. And he wanted to leave us behind. Now. This is the angle he took. I want you to go and study the material. Go to his website. The reason why <clears throat> I don't talk about Sunday being the Sabbath first, let's say it was what you called it was that you are a Sabbatarian, you're a first-day Sabbatarian, because I don't want them to nail me yeah. and ask me to show them in Scripture where it says Sunday is now the Sabbath day. So I'm meeting them where they're at. I am taking into consideration what their objection will be and my response, because I have to be honest to Scripture. And secondly, I have to know what their argument is so I can provide an honest, faithful, exegetical refutation. Because if they press me on it, all right, what you said from Hebrews 4, couldn't the Bible, I'm not, and I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just saying I'm already thinking of how they're going to respond. Because you have to, when you're doing apologetics, and says this for the rest of you, you have to think 50 steps ahead of your opponent like spiritual chess. Anticipate. If I say this, they'll say this. If they say that, I'll... Already be prepared. This is why when I do these sessions, I've already, in my mind, know how they're going to respond. 
So I'm prepared for it by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Everything good is from the Holy Spirit. May he bless us to speak clearly and accurately without error and walk in the truth. Now, I want to now give you my response to him because he's dealing with me. Okay. Did you see how he actually made my point? Because, again, he is naive. He doesn't know the Bible, doesn't know scripture. He's just a cult follower of a false prophetess who's under the feet of Christ. He just proved the point that the words, though different, are used synonymously. Because if you remember, he said in verse 3, it's not the word <clears throat> Sabbath, sabbatismos. It's another word. But you see, words are defined in context. I want you to listen to this final point. Because we're going to come back with a part two, Lord willing. Words are defined in their context. And because of Einstein not realizing that words can be used synonymous, synonymously and interchangeably. The rest of Hebrews 4.3 is the rest you experience when you enter God's sabbatismos. But the Einstein, thinking he had something against me, didn't realize that the entire point of that passage is if you want to experience this rest, then you must enter into God's sabbatismos to experience the rest mentioned in Hebrews 4. See why I say, Craig, you're stupid? You're a Bible pervert, which is why you should stay in your box, because you're so stupid you don't see how the Lord is handing you over to your stupidity. Because answer a fool according to his folly, lest he becomes wise in his own mind. For example, open up Hebrews 4 for me if you can. And I'm going to give you my response to him. And whatever everything he said is spot on. I don't disagree. And I owe to what he said. I do believe that Sunday is the day that we gather because it is the Lord who through his death and resurrection, triumphing over death, the grave, and sin on Sunday, by ushering in this eternal rest on Sunday, we gather on that day because this is the day the Lord has wrought this victory for us, a new creation. Yeah. It's a memorial of, of God's rest. Yeah. It's so a time I, where we are, we are stopping to remember what Christ accomplished, looking forward to entering into the, the physical new uh, God's rest where Christ has entered ahead of us. So if you go to Hebrews 4, let's open it up. Now watch the genius because he doesn't know how to read context. None of them know how to read context. They don't know context. So he's saying the word in Hebrews 4.3 is kata pausis. Kata pausis. Kata pausis. All right. Brethren, words are used synonymously, interchangeably. But now let's play his game. We're going to go to the Bible right here. All right. Did you bring it up? Okay. Now watch. I'm going to read it. Follow me. How do you attain this kata posis of verse 3? Watch. Poor Greg, when the Lord wants to rebuke someone for being a Bible butcher, he really shames, shames him. And you got disgrace. And this is just part one. Watch what we're going to unleash on you by the grace of God in part two. You got to go up to the top so I can read from the top. Watch here, guys. Now, watch what I'm going to establish. The kata posis of three is only attained and realized when you enter God's sabbatismos. His Sabbath, which began after creation. Watch here. Thank you, Kiri. I'm trying to pronounce it like you Greek people would. Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, the promise of entering his rest still stands, right? Okay, that's the word, kata posis. Yep. Let us fear lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. For good news came to us, gospel, that's the word gospel, just as to them. But the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who believed or listened. They didn't believe. For we who have believed enter the rest. Oh, see, it's not sabbatismos. Now pay attention to enter the rest. How do I enter this kataposis? Okay. As he has said, as I sworn my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. Do you see the burial? Did you catch it right there? Okay, guys. What is this kata posis connected with? God resting from his works on the Sabbath. He quotes verse 3. He focuses on it being a different Greek word. But the word in the verse is referring to God entering his Sabbath after resting from his works. After the six-day creation. Do you guys see that? It's right there, verse 3. You guys see it? 
He says, see, verse 3 is not sabatismos, karaposis, to tell you what a son of the devil he is. But wait, that verse just mentioned in connection with karaposis, God rested from his works from the foundation of the world. Gee, I wonder what karaposis is referring to. Could it be the Sabbath of God? Hmm, I wonder. And not just that, but Sam, remember that he said earlier, the Bible nowhere talks of God's rest. He said that three times. Yes, and it does right here, right? But did you guys catch how the verse he says, karaposis, that tells you the guy don't read. He's blind by Satan. You mean the verse that used the word rest in connection with God having rested from his works when he entered on his Sabbath, his sabbatismos? That very verse? Damn. For he has somewhere spoken of this. Wait. Hold on, guys. So Hebrews connects the Sabbath of God with the kataposis. For he has somewhere spoken of the seventh day. Brother, you mean in verses 3 and 4, the kataposis is a direct reference to the seventh day? Right here? That's that's correct. Wow. For he has somewhere spoken of the seventh day in this way. And God rested on the seventh day from all his works. Now, he better not come back and say, well, no, that's not the Sabbath of God because it uses the word kataposis. But kataposis is being used in reference to the seventh day which is when God did his kataposis, rested from his works, when he entered his sabbatismos. You, you think you know Greek. Anyway, and again, in this passage, he said, they shall not enter my rest. Oh, bro, so he just connected the kataposis, Psalm 95, with a sabbatismos of Genesis 2. <whistles> Ow! Since therefore it remains for some to enter it. Enter what? God's kataposis, my kataposis, which is God's sabbatismos. Do you see how it's used interchangeably? Brethren, not, he knows this. I'm talking to you guys. Do you see how this passage just exposed? You are a son of the devil, Greg. I hope you repent before it's too late for you because it's too late for LNG White. How dare you think you'd get away with this butchering of scripture when in the context that a kataposis is used interchangeably with sabbatismos because God's Kataposis is his sabbatismos. His Sabbath day, seven day, is his rest. They're interchangeable. Since, therefore, it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly received the good news failed to enter because of disobedience, again, he points a certain day. Well, you didn't enter my kataposis, which is my sabbatismos, so I'm going to sign another day. What day is that, Lord? Today, saying through David, so long afterward, and the words already quoted, today, if you hear his voice, do not harm your hearts. For if Joshua, and I'll do a session on Hebrews 4, 8, because I'm going to tell you who Joshua is. I'm going to confirm what you said. You'll be shocked when I do it. I'll probably do it later this week. For if Joshua had given them rest, God, and by the way, the Greek doesn't have the word God. It says, for if Joshua had given them rest, he would not have spoken of another day later on. So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. Oh, my goodness. He just connected the kataposis, the rest, with the sabbatismos, the seventh day, the Sabbath of God, so that if you want to enter God's kataposis, you do so by faith in Christ. And when you believe in Christ, God's kataposis becomes God's sabbatismos. The words are interchangeable. So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. Forever has entered God's rest, has also rested from his works as God did from his. Oh, wait, wait, brother. So when I enter the Sabbath day of God, then I too rest from my works as God rested from his. Now, brother, can you tell me what day did God rest from his works? The seventh day. Do you know what the word in verse 10, the word for God's rest is? It's kataposis. Uh, yeah, I was just about to say, because the only place that sabbatismos is used is back in verse 9. But wait, brother, if in verse 10, God's rest is called <clears throat> kataposis, but that kataposis is defined in verse 9 as God's Sabbath, sabbatismos, what the hell was this guy talking about? 
he doesn't know what he's talking about because again, Sam, he's literally parroting the talking points that the organization has handed off to its its members. And he's just running with that because this is a dime a dozen claim that they always make about this chapter. You guys caught it, right? So guys, not only did he just destroy his argument, Hebrews 4, I actually showed you that if you read the context honestly, with integrity, because you're told by God, you better tread lightly when you interpret scripture and not manhandle it. And we serve a God of truth and we have to be as honest as possible. You see how the two words, kataposis and sabbatismos, they're both being used to refer to God resting from his works and entering his Sabbath on the seventh day. What a wicked tool of the devil, this guy. Now, brother, brownie point. I want you to open up Hebrews 4, 8 in the King James Version. I'm going to make your case stronger for you. That is Jesus. Because they, the translators decided to take liberties to tell you what they think it means. And I'll do a session on this, Lord willing. Now, Hebrews 4, verse 8. Let me prove to you it's Jesus that did the work for us and went ahead as a forerunner and prepared that rest day. Because if you read it, the Greek word is Isus. Now, the word Isus can refer to Joshua or Jesus because Joshua is a type of Jesus. Now, if you don't add the word God in the verse, because the word God is not there, watch the difference in translation. Read Hebrews 4, 8 for me. For if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day? Who spoke of another day? Jesus. So if you go with the Greek, it's Jesus being referred to, not Joshua. Jesus brought them into the land, but then Jesus spoke of another day, thereby identifying Jesus as Yahweh of Psalm 95. This is the Greek, but the translators not wanting to read Jesus back into the passage yeah. because they're thinking, well, you know, we can't read too much Jesus in the Old Testament, decided to go with Joshua. And in some translations, they add the word God and said he, thereby confusing you. But it's not God. It's for if Jesus had given them rest, would he then not afterward have spoken of another day that he is Jesus? So it can't yeah. be Joshua. And don't forget this movement. I don't know about Greg. But this movement does not believe that Jesus is Yahweh. Wow. But the Jehovah. psalmist, Psalm 95, sound about what Yahweh said entering my rest. Not just that, Sam, but Jude in Jude 5 yeah. says that Jesus was the one that led Israel out of the wilderness, gave them the law. Yes. And then if you go back in Deuteronomy 5, the giving of the fourth commandment, we didn't look at this verse, but verse 17, 517, specifically says, who was it that, that led them out of Egypt, Sam? Yeah. Jehovah. Yahweh, Yahweh. And, you know, to add to your point, which you know this, it's 1 Corinthians 10, 1, 4, it says the spiritual yeah, rock, the rock in the cloud was Christ. But another one in Hebrews for you. Hebrews 11, 24 to 27, it says that Moses gave up everything for the sake of Christ. And you know yeah. this already. But for you guys to show that it's Jesus, it's not Joshua. Hebrews 11, 24 to 27. Now, you can see in the King James that NIV captures it too, but read. Read 26, 27. It's on about Moses. Esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the, of the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. So what is being said here is that Moses accepted being reproached, insulted for the sake of Christ. And he saw him who was invisible, meaning Christ. That's why for the NIV, it captures it perfectly. One second. I'm on a live stream. I'll call you guys back. I'll call you right back for a couple of minutes. So check it out. NIV, look how it reads. And we're done, guys. We'll come back part two, Lord Wing, sometime this week. Watch here. So Hebrews 4, 8 and Hebrews 11, 26, 27, prove it was Jesus that was with Moses and Joshua. And Jesus spoke in Psalm 95 because why did Moses give up the status of Egypt? Here. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. By faith, he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He per he persevered because he saw him who is invisible. Case closed for you, brother. Hebrews 4, 8. It's Jesus who brought them into the land, but then afterwards spoke of another day and Moses gave up the status and position of being the son of Pharaoh for Jesus' sake. It's all about Jesus. So I hope that helped you, brother. Now, Lord willing, guys, we had over 900 people. May our numbers increase for the glory of Christ. You have the link to his channel. 
Support him in his destruction of answering Adventism. Lord willing, he'll be back on for part two sometime this week. I should be available, but he will coordinate that. Brother, any final words before we wrap up? Uh, may the triune God be glorified. May he, he put this enemy, this false God, underneath his feet Hallelujah. as Christ's footstool. This movement will insist to you and tell you, no, 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 we're Trinitarians. No, they're not. They are not Trinitarians. They have a different God. They have a unique mission that they believe only they have with a unique message that only they are spreading. They are not Christians. I say this not to pick on them, but to say we need to be reaching these people with the right. truth. Um, they Again, they, they are enemies of the triune God, and no matter what sort of wrapping paper they try to put around it, um, this is the facts. So we are sounding that alarm loudly on our platform. I'm very similar to you in many regards, Sam, as I'm just not a sort of like, we're going to hold all the punches and kind of do this like, oh, well, there's been too much of that for years. There's been lots of people that left Adventism that, that tried that route. They received the same treatment that people like I do who are a little bit more of a firebrand, et cetera. So we don't hold any punches. We're, we, I've always said this is a spiritual battle. We are in the trenches with bullets whizzing past our heads. There's people back in the camp in the soup kitchen that are nursing people's wounds on the battlefield. That's fine. That's their thing. God bless them. But our platform is not necessarily like that. So we kind of just shoot it straight. And it's really a systematic approach and dismantling of this system from tons of different angles. And so um, basically, we're typically dealing as well with things that are just kind of like Apostles Creed level issues. It's not like taking umbrage with literally every single thing here and there. There's some things I just don't really fault them on, but all of that to say it's an educational platform. Come check us out. Uh, you will find the information useful, beneficial to equip yourself in this apologetic. Now see hear the advice of saying, brother, we love you. You're brilliant, but slow it down. My brother. <laughs> I know <laughs> you don't need to rush. We can do two, three parts. As long as God gives us holiness and health, you got a platform here. So slow it down. But guys, if you want, rewind this. You can upload this. He can upload it. It's his. But go to his channel for more. So Lord willing, we'll be back this week. Everyone loved it. This, so this person to answer uh, wisdom, uh, I'll, I'll do it again when we when we come back. Um, but also maybe Sam can put it in the description box or I can comment it under the video. Uh, I will comment. I have a video where I've gone through this very slowly okay, in good. two hours. <laughs> very slowly on my platform where I'm a little bit more, uh, when, when I'm kind of in control, I'm, I'm a little, uh, I guess I'm a little slower on my own platform. So Lord willing. So we'll let you know, it'll be announced when we do part two, sometimes week, whatever schedule opens up. So Christ is risen, risen indeed. Maranatha. I gotta go take care guys. God bless.